morning and welcome to the December 12th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Could we start with a roll call? Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? <laughs> Chair Leopold? Here. Uh, well, could you please uh, join us in a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance? Good morning, Mr. Palacio. So are there any additions or uh, deletions from today's uh, agenda? Uh, yes, there are. On the consent agenda, item number 17, uh, there's additional materials, a revised board memo. Uh, on item number 20, uh, there's a correction. The item should read, approve the appointment of David Hermosillo to the Emergency Medical Care Commission. On item 33, there's a correction. The item should read, adopt a resolution. On item 44, there's a correction. The item should read, adopt resolutions accepting unanticipated revenue and take related actions. On item 46, there's additional material, a replacement page 43 of attachment A. On item 48, there's a correction. The item should read, adopt resolution accepting and appropriating unanticipated revenue in the, in the amount of $32,217 from FEMA and Cal OES for preliminary engineering and geotechnical services, and in the amount of $3,888 for Blue, Ridge, Blue Mountain Ridge Zone residents for emergency repair work. There's also on item 48 additional materials. There's a replacement board memo, deleted attachment A, and revised attachment B. <coughs> on the closed session, uh, the item should be uh, item 56. Uh, and there's a revised um, agenda, page eight, along with that closed session item. And then finally, on the regular agenda, uh, item 63, there's a replacement board memo, a clean and strikeout underlying copies, a memorandum of the planning director dated December 11th, and um, includes United, uh, United Fee Schedule uh, worksheets. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now we'll turn to members of the board to see if there's anything on the consent agenda that they'd like to comment on or pull. Good morning, Supervisor Caput. Good morning, uh, nothing to pull. I'll make a, a welcome, uh, item 20 and 21, uh, David Hermosillo uh, to be appointed to the Emergency Medical Care Commission, and 21, uh, appointment of Sam uh, Cooley, to the Fish and Wildlife Adv Advisory Board. And then on item 44, uh, that would be the uh, approve the contract for the Behavioral Health Office building in Watsonville. It's gonna be really wonderful for the community down there. And I appreciate all the work you've done with that, uh, Jane. And, uh, I also appro uh, appreciate the options that you offered on those uh, trees that are in the parking lot. And I think you've received uh, some emails on that. Uh, they're rare uh, uh, Italian pines and uh, they're the last ones in the area. And we had an arborist uh, look at it and uh, uh, there's about three to four options. Uh, maybe we can uh, we can save them and use one of the options we received from your report. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, yeah. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'd like to comment on a couple of items on the consent agenda, not to pull any of them. Uh, but uh, items 9 and 47, uh, just that um, to get this report on the excess revenue of our county library fund, um, and we're going to be uh, getting a a cash flow report in February, end of February. On uh, the uh, number, item 47, the request for qualification for construction of the Felton Library. This is a big deal in the San Lorenzo Valley. It's been uh, long uh, desired and it's finally gonna happen. I think we'll begin, I hope, construction in the spring sometime. 
Um, I want to just mention also on item number 11, the progress report on development of drop-in drop uh, day centers, both for the north and south county, for Santa Cruz and Watsonville. Uh, very much appreciated, and uh, I'm glad we're making a move in both uh, sections of the county, in the north and south. Uh, on item number 12, on our Vision Santa Cruz report, uh, I want to thank uh, Nicole Coburn from our uh, CAO's office in particular for uh, really getting this together and for everybody who has participated in that. This is really important to the people of Santa Cruz County for our future. I appreciate the turnout. We had the first meeting of this um, um, Vision Santa Cruz County uh, in Santa Rosa Valley. It was very well attended. I encourage people in the public to um, help us look at uh, what we want to do in the future in Santa Cruz County. Uh, there will be more meetings in, coming up. On item 23, uh, the public, um, af in the aftermath of the Bear Fire up in Santa Rosa Valley, uh, there's a, a measure here, or a, an item here to um, waive the landfill fees uh, for victims um, of the Bear Creek Fire so they can have a f free access fee. I would like to see a sunset date maybe added to that so that they could do that until the end of February. Um, so they have enough time to uh, to do that, uh, to get the, the necessary materials to the uh, landfill. And um, there's um, also on um, the consent agenda on items 45, 49, and 50, these are items all uh, relate to the uh, repairing and improving of our roads. Uh, last winter's uh, storm recovery report and hiring a consultant to update um, what with the, the county pave, pavement management um, plan, and uh, for our capital improvement plan for 19 for this for this fiscal year for 2017-18, uh, this effort's going to take years, but we have a really good start. I want to compliment the Public Works Department for putting some things together. There are <coughs> folks I've heard from that um, want their road fixed uh, yesterday, and uh, we just have a process and a. Um, some limitations on funding of what we can do, but we do have more funding than we have in the past because of Measure D and uh, Senate Bill 1 by the state legislature. So um, I just want to compliment the Public Works Department for putting this package together. Uh, we're getting there as quickly as we can and I think as efficiently as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning and a happy Hanukkah to my colleague, <laughs> Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy Hanukkah to you. Um, a uh, couple items to comment on, uh, no items to pull. Uh, the first, as Supervisor McPherson mentioned, is item number 11, which is a day services center uh, for homeless people. I want to thank city and county staff for working on it. We clearly are in a crisis and we need a, uh, a an interim solution till we can find a more permanent solution. Again, I want to emphasize, as I've said previously, I don't want uh, the search for a perfect location to be the enemy of a good location. And I'm hopeful that when we get a report back on homeless issues on January 9th, we'll have a day services center open at that point. On item number 12, which is uh, our strategic plan, um, I want to first of all commend the staff for doing really good outreach and reaching out to many members of the community and I want to emphasize that we got to make sure we reach out to the underserved and Spanish speaking <coughs> communities uh, to make sure that their voices are heard and go to them uh, and make sure that they, they have way in on the future uh, and priorities of this county. On item number 15, I want to thank uh, Watsonville Mayor Oscar Rios for connecting uh, and facilitating uh, the, do the donation of the surplus fire truck to our new to Watsonville's new sister city in El Salvador. Uh, this is a great way to repurpose a truck uh, and uh, to deal with what would otherwise be surplus county property. On item number 24, which is our FEMA policy, I want to add uh, additional direction that we notify our members of Congress uh, of this so that we can uh, get their assistance when needed um, in getting um, uh, resources to deal with uh, storm damage. 
And then uh, on item number 31, the whole person care initiative. This is an exciting initiative, and I wanna thank HSA and Director Wynn for their leadership uh, in making this happen. And I'd like to add the additional direction that in each future quarterly report that the numbers of enrolled climbers is included uh, and that also the geographic location where those clients reside at the time of enrollment is included. This is, this is a, gives us the ability to see where clients are being enrolled and how we can partner with other agencies uh, to increase enrollment. And then finally on item number 33, I wanna thank uh, First Five uh, Commissioner, uh, Director David Brody and Ellen Timberlake uh, from HSD for their good work on Thrive by Three. And it's, as we've said before, this is really exceeding all of our uh, expectations and it's a really tremendous opportunity. It's nice to see the money and resources being allocated uh, to help uh, moms and uh, and their kids and uh, young families as they as they uh, work in the first key years of life. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Friend, and happy Hanukkah to you as well. Thank you, Chair. I have nothing to pull and I have nothing to comment on. Good morning. All right. Well. Uh, uh, I have a number of items to speak about. There are many, many things on this agenda. I'm not gonna talk about them all, but, I, uh, but there are a number of them. On item number 12, which is the Vision Santa Cruz County process, I too wanna commend the staff. The meeting we had in Live Oak I thought was a very, very good meeting, um, and there was good conversation. Uh, I see some of the people who were at the meeting are here uh, today. Uh, they could also speak to that. Uh, and I also wanna reiterate, uh, what my colleague mentioned about ensuring that we do this process that includes all the members of the community and have specific outreach to the Spanish-speaking members of our community. And uh, uh, our staff and others are willing to help. On uh, item number uh, 29, which is the releasing the request for proposals for dental health care services, we know because we've seen the, 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 uh, the research and the report about uh, the need for a great dental services in uh, Santa Cruz County, especially for people who can least afford it. Uh, we've received some great services from Dientes, who's celebrating 25 years, and uh, I hope they'll be seriously considered as part of uh, this uh, RFP process. Um, on item number 32, I wanna thank the Health Services Agency, uh, adding these new uh, staff members for the mobile emergency response uh, team program is really critical to the success of all the programs. We'll be talking about a number of them uh, later on today, but the, 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 uh, the commitment to ensuring that we have the staffing to be able to effectively run these programs will mean that uh, our entire county will experience a better quality of life and it will be better services for people most in need. Uh, on item number uh, 38, uh, which is, uh, 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 accepting over $1 million worth of funds uh, for uh, some park projects located in, uh, in the first district. I wanna thank the staff for all the hard work, um, uh, members of our commission who, uh, who have supported this and doing all the work that we can to make sure that we get these parks built. Uh, I really appreciate the outstanding effort that we've seen, so thank you very much uh, for that. Um, on item number 39, I'm really glad to see that we're gonna be uh, going out for uh, design uh, services for the Live Oak Library an Annex. Uh, I think this is an exciting uh, development and the conversations that have been held so far with the institutional members will, will be greatly um, enhanced by seeing some designs and being able to talk to the community about it. So I'm very excited. Um, on item number 41, I'm glad to see that we're moving forward with a pre-development loan to Mid-Pen Housing for the 17th and Capitola Road. Um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done on that project, but um, one of the things that people told us they wanted to see is they wanted to see affordable housing at that site, and I'm glad that we've, we're, we are negotiating with a, a, a partner who knows how to do that well. So thank you for your work. On item number 49, which is the uh, agreement for the county pavement management uh, program. Uh, this is gonna be a, a, a really key document for us. It, it always is a key document for us, um, but the landscape has changed um, with the introduction of the Measure D funds, the SB1 funds, um, the commitment that this board made to add a million dollars uh, to 
our road programs. And I think when this report comes back and we have the presentation, we need to take a look at the designations we've already made for uh, the, uh, some of these uh, funds, especially it relates to the storm damage, um, and have some information about how these additional funds will help us with uh, uh, changing the known backlog that we have of projects. I think it's good. We, we're in a new era with, uh, with our road funding and we have to treat it that way. Um, I think that's the last item. So now I will look to see if there are members of the public who would like to comment on consent items. Can please come forward, tell us uh, which item you're commenting on. Gary Richard Arnold, 22 and 24. Um, we just gave a Pledge of Allegiance to uh, a country indivisible, and I believe that we should end race-based commissions. As you can see from sitting up there, the audience, we have people from every race here, and I believe it's detrimental uh, to equality, it's detrimental to the community integrating, and we see each other as, as individuals, not as races. So I wish you would end these race-based commissions. On 24, um, there's pre prejudicial application of services. For instance, in the Moran Lagoon over there, there are trees that are thinned and trimmed and taken down to about 60% to protect some residences there. It happens that an attorney that works for an insurance company occupies that particular house. Yet 30 yards away, we find the remains of a gauntlet of guillotines and uh, huge eucalyptus trees uh, overshadowing other houses in that area. There continues to be root balls that are high in the ground with three or four or five feet deep, uh, halfway covered with shrubs, uh, places where children, dogs, and other people can get hurt. Um, I believe it's uh, the repetition of those trees falling on houses and even the own, uh, your own uh, construction of bathrooms there has been not misfeasance but malfeasance because anybody can look at those trees, see the three foot roots uh, planted in landfill from the harbor on a slanted cliff is dangerous and any arborist that approves those, you should fire him. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos Hills. I would like to pull item number 11 and put that on the regular agenda for discussion because I read that your board is considering declaring a local state of emergency and I think that needs to be discussed more publicly. <clears throat> I'll move along because my time is moving. Um, I also want to uh, point out that in number nine, regarding the library funding, um, I, I'm confused that we now have a $4.5 million excess in our library fund, and not long ago when um, Measure S was being campaigned, it seemed like we were in dire straits and things were gonna get shut down if it didn't get passed. Related, I want to point out item number 13, a lot changes code to allow philanthropic naming of libraries. And again, this is another fundraising tactic that um, I'm confused by if the libraries are in such poor state of, um, in such excellent state of, of financial health. Number 39 also related is the uh, Live Oak library annex, which I think is deceptive to use um, that term when in the description of the initial contract going out to MIG, it described this facility as having a very small collection of books. I think it's uh, disingenuous to use Measure S funds for this building that is really a community center, and I'm not opposed to building that um, that facility next to the Boys and Girls Club of Live Oak and the Simkins Swim Center, but let's be honest here about what it is and um, proportionally use Measure S funds, if at all, for its building. I also protest the use of MIG. They pushed through the Aptos Village plan. They were the ones that handled the recent Live Oak, um, not Live Oak, but 
Pleasure Point community meeting, and that was nothing but a railroad job. <laughs> it was incredible. Um, item number 15, I'm really glad that the rescue unit, not the engine, will be um, given to Watsonville and repaired and sent to El Salvador. And I want to make sure that the excess engine, 3912 funds, when that's auctioned off, do indeed go to the county fire fund and not some other use. Item number 41, I want to make sure that in the Capitola Road, 17th Avenue, affordable housing, the Merriman House is preserved. It could be used for the health facility that is scheduled to be there. Please don't demolish that. Number 17, uh, I want you to deny the uh, extension of the cafeteria license related to number 11. Let's house the homeless people there for the, not house, but for the day center there. It makes sense, and the county owns it, and we could do it now. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 11 will become 64.1. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold, board members. I'm Maggie Ivey with Visit Santa Cruz County. Just here to thank the board for your continued support of the Tourism Marketing District. Uh, approval of our annual plan is um, item number 10 on your consent agenda. I want to thank Supervisor McPherson for his continued service on our board. Uh, just a couple of pieces of good news about the tourism industry. Hotel occupancy is up 2% this year, which is actually quite higher than the state average, which is fairly flat in our neighboring communities. And this last year, we released new research about our international market. So the long-term planning of the marketing district has allowed us to do a lot more emphasis on longer-term market share building of the international um, visitation to California. We partner with Visit California, and our international visitors make up 13% of our visitors now versus 8% just a few years ago. We welcome a lot of UK visitors, Germany, um, Australia and Canadians as well. So thank you for your continued support and um, happy holidays. Thank you. And good morning. Good morning, my name is Trisha Potts and I'm from Watsonville and I'm here to talk about uh, number 38, just to say thank you, we're on to the next phase. Uh, literally four years ago this week, um, the Parks Department got an email from me uh, saying we needed to work on uh, what became known as the Chanticleer Park Project, the Leo's Haven, and you know, it's just really rewarding to see that we're moving into the next step. And I'm here to say thank you to Jeff Gaffney and Will Fort, particularly Will today because he's responsible for dealing with all the crazy details of this project as well as Mariah Roberts with the Chanticleer Park neighbors. And um, you know, this is a big project. We've done a lot and we have a lot to go forward with and so I just leave you with a story today. Um, when I get overwhelmed, when I think about how big this project is, it's, it's the kids and the families that I'm meeting. Um, and I just met uh, a, a mom and a grandma from Watsonville and uh, they slipped in a, a donation um, from a commission from their uh, last real estate development. And with them was their nine month old daughter and granddaughter, Abby, um, and she has Down syndrome. And as, as we were talking, they said, this is where Abby's going to get to go to play. And you know, Abby wasn't even born when we started this. And so it's really exciting to see this happening. And thank you so much for uh, being willing to move forward with this public-private partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Mariah Roberts from Chanticleer Park Neighbors. Um, and really quick, I have some things I wanted to say about item 38, but I also just wanted to remark also about the annex, the library annex. Um, <clears throat> one thing that um, I've been hearing just as a Live Oak citizen is the acknowledgement that libraries have really taken on many different forms in our current environment with technology and how they fit into the fabric of our lives. And so looking at what a library can be versus historically what they were, which was more of a repository for books. So it really excites me that there's some creative thinking about how to use a space and how to um, increase access to information. Um, so as Trisha mentioned, in June of 2015, you all voted to adopt the MOU for um, the county and our private uh, nonprofits to move forward with this private-public partnership. And that was the start of us really being able to uh, move Leo's Haven at Chanticleer Park forward. So that partnership, which was worked 
you know, so much work that went to lead to that um, with former CAO Susan Moriello, um, staff from Parks Department, has really given us the blueprint that has allowed us to have the success that we've had. We hope that that can be um, an example for other private-public partnerships and projects in your various um, districts going forward. We welcome any questions about that. Um, today, in your consent agenda, number 38, um, item number 38, you are voting to move forward and to um, go into the next phase from the county side. And so we feel really good on the private side about our fundraising and where we're at, and we just want to acknowledge that partnership, that it takes both of us and all of us to make this happen, and that this is a, a significant next step um, for us in the process. So thank you for that. Here's to the next little bit. We're going to get there. Okay. Thank and you. And happy Hanukkah. <laughs> uh, and thank you to both of you for the great uh, 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 fundraising event you held just two weeks ago. Um, we enjoyed Johnny Cash. We got to dress in black. And uh, it, was, it was a great event, uh, and it raised a bunch of money. So congratulations. Hello again, Supervisors. Tom Del Conte, Vision Recycling. No worries. I'm not here to do any protest appeals or anything like that. We um, had a nice conversation about the Green Waste Yard Waste uh, Program. You voted another direction. That's fine. Um, as you know, I'm not real comfortable talking in front of the uh, public like this. I wouldn't be here, but uh, the guys have asked me to come and talk, the middle managers and the, um, uh, not to appeal, um, the uh, middle managers. Is this an item workers? from a consent agenda? Because we'll have oral communications. No, I don't think so. I so think so you it. might want to just wait. Right now we're just doing the consent agenda items, Tom. I just want to, uh, uh, we'll just wait a moment. We'll finish ah. that and then we'll come up for oral communications. You want me to just finish? Let, 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 let's just finish the consent agenda. Might give me another shot to relax a little bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> These are items on the consent agenda. And I'm Leslie Meehan from the Blue Mountain Ridge in the Santa Cruz Mountains about consent item 48. I just wanted to say thank you for um, Bruce's staff people, Jenny, we just met with Jenny and Marcella from Public Works. We're in the first steps of being able to form a sub-CSA in CSA 23 to uh, repair our road from the storms and to be part of the county infrastructure of maintaining our road. And it is such a relief to us to be able to do that. And we have a, an arrangement with the Santa Cruz County Bank that um, they're working with the county to help us fund repairs um, so we don't have to spend $50,000 out of pocket right now. And just the opportunity to do that, we were just thanking Jenny and Marcella for um, being here because this is the county serving its um, people. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else about items on the consent agenda? Number nine, library funds. The young woman who spoke recent, just before me um, was talking about libraries and traditionally what they've been and what they could be with technology. I object to making libraries Wi-Fi hotspots because it's a biological health hazard and also a problem for people who already have disabilities, functional impairment due to microwave exposure, especially damage to children. Ms. Garrett, if we're gonna get the same uh, conversation Excuse me, during, uh, I am uh, addressing the library. Item nine is about funding. That's it's about what I'm funding talking of the libraries. about. So funding of the libraries. Funding should not go to more technology in the libraries. It should go to making libraries safe place to read that are not microwaved. And I've given you this before. Wi-Fi in the library, convenience or health hazard. And all the libraries now are toxic places where this detection meter is just like in here. You can't go to a place where you're not getting assaulted involuntarily and harmed by microwaves. I've given you this before. It shows brain cell damage from microwaves. Libraries should be safe places. This technology that is documented to be dangerous really needs to be removed. I help pay for libraries with my taxes. I rarely go in because I don't 
doesn't feel good, and it's hard for me to come here, but I feel it's my public citizen responsibility to try to give you direction and alert the public to the facts of the harm of wireless microwave technology. Thank you. Thank you. Other items on the consent agenda? You don't get a second bite at the apple. Um, you'll have, have, to wait till, you'll have to wait till oral communication. Is this being recorded because there's no video of the meetings, proceedings on the screen? I just want to make sure it's being recorded. That's all. Thank you. I'm assuming it's being recorded. Someone will tell me if it's, it's not being recorded. Seeing no one else for the consent agenda, I'll bring it back to our board for action. There were additional directions on item number 23 and 31. Um, is that clear to the, to the to the clerk? Thirty-one was about the the uh, having a uh, sunset on the on the waiver of fees at at the end of February, and on item number twenty-three, and I won't. twenty-four as well. And twenty-four was just notifying our members of Congress. Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you for uh, that correction. So I'll move the consent agenda as amended. Motion by Coonerty, seconded by McPherson. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now we've reached the oral communication portion of our meeting. This is the chance to uh, address the Board of Supervisors on issues under our purview, um, uh, but not on today's agenda. Um, you'll have three minutes to speak. A green light will come on when, it's, uh, when you start, a yellow light when you have one minute left, and a red light when you should end. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Leopold, members of the Board, and happy holidays. I'm Reed Geisreiter, Chair of your Santa Cruz County Housing Advisory Commission affectionately known as the hack. I want to make two points today to tell you a little bit about the hack and its recent activities. First, the hack formed an ad hoc committee some months ago to engage with the many great organizations working to tackle the current housing crisis in our county. The goal was to flesh out common action items among these groups that could then be implemented over time by the county. Under your leadership, the county has a robust housing program already. That said, the ad hoc committee did generate several recommendations for your consideration. The written report is included in today's agenda as correspondence. The HAC Vice Chair, Jan Brown, will speak after me and provide you more details on these recommendations. And second, this is my second year as the Chair of the HAC. When Supervisor Coonerty appointed me several years ago, the HAC suffered from apathy and at times could not muster a quorum. I'm pleased to report to you today that with the recent appointment of several commissioners by your board, the HAC never lacks for a quorum. We have an organized agenda. We have, uh, a, we routinely have a healthy debate about housing issues in this county, and I'm very proud of that. We enjoy working with your housing staff, and the commission thanks you for the opportunity to serve in this very important role. So with that, now Jan Brown will talk to you a little bit about the HAC committee report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Reed, Chair Leopold, members of the board. Um, the HACS Ad Hoc Committee spent the better part of a year gathering input from public agencies and private organizations seeking solutions to the housing crisis. The goal of gathering that input from more than a dozen stakeholders was to collect information about their work and to hear suggestions about potential action by the county. In addition to the four incorporated cities, stakeholders included Affordable Housing Now, the Housing Advocacy Network, MedPen Housing, New Way Homes slash Envision Housing, and the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. What we learned essentially is that some of what is supported by these groups is already underway or in the pipeline for the county, largely by way of the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan. However, due to staff resources and other constraints, we found that the work to implement the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan is not happening quickly enough to stimulate the creation of a substantial amount of affordable housing or additional housing in the market generally. So on November 1st, the HAC unanimously passed the following recommendations for board consideration. The first, were, uh, the first two are priority recommendations that could be achieved in the short term, while the others require additional coordination with the planning department. They are to expedite implementation of the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan to include zoning ordinance changes, density recalculations, and fee adjustments by providing adequate funding and other resources for the planning department to hire additional staff or consultants to complete the work. Secondly, to streamline the planning process to encourage housing development that better meets the needs outlined in the housing element of the general plan. 
Thirdly, to review underutilized commercial and industrial parcels throughout the county to determine whether they are suitable for housing and then allow for a process to rezone and establish by right development standards. Fourth, to proactively work with the owners of large private property to determine sustainability or suitability for uh, the encouragement of housing development. Lastly, to seek a local funding source for affordable housing creation, including possible support of a countywide housing bond proposal being considered for the November 2018 ballot by private advocacy groups. So as you consider both the affordable housing program update on your agenda today and the ongoing Vision Santa Cruz County planning process, we would just ask that you consider the HACS recommendations uh, or possibly schedule a discussion uh, about our recommendations on a future agenda. And lastly, I'd just like to thank my fellow commissioners who served with me on that committee. They are Commissioners Nancy Abbey, Kent Washburn, and Linda Haynes. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for your work on the, on the commission. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, and quickly trying to talk about uh, uh, individual rights and the policies and influence on the board here. Uh, most people associate the ACLU with uh, the uh, First Amendment and other rights. Uh, let me quote from the founder. Uh, the founder was Roger Baldwin. He says, I'm for socialism. I seek for social ownership of property. Communism is the goal. And he added, when power is achieved as it has been in the Soviet Union, I'm for maintaining it by any means necessary. We know the ACLU has given uh, our supervisors, our congressmen, uh, the man that uh, provided the uh, protocols for the planning department uh, received awards from the local ACLU. Um, we know that he, uh, Leon Panetta, who received an award, sent military information to Hugh DeLacy, a communist spy. Uh, we know that the uh, planning board and supervisors have accepted uh, both the United Nations and World Bank uh, operating protocols from Dan Hefley, the 60 pages adopted by your planning department. It was Mike Rockin, the head of the local ACLU and his thesis at UCSC that uh, uh, purported and is available online how to take over a town that has been done. The influence of the newspapers here, which is either endorsed or opposed, most of the people up here, of course, was uh, run by Dow Jones for a number. One of the editors was Mr. Bruce McPherson, who received money from Katrina Luenda, a triple agent from Communist China. China. As editor from over 65 million seniors at the time, he hired Claude Pepper to be the senior columnist. Newsweek and Time called uh, him Red Pepper. Saturday Evening Post called him Pinko Pepper. U.S. News and Reports said Pepper is the foremost advocate of Russian policy. Uh, Pepper wrote the foreword to a, brook, a book that was created in the Soviet office. He also worked for a group specializing in pro-Soviet propaganda. Uh, Claude Pepper, the person Bruce McPherson chose also hired Charles Kramer, who was a member of the Ware and Perlow spy rings. I want to mention that Mr. McPherson and the rest of you continue to maintain two plaques on the courthouse steps of Hugh DeLacy, a communist enforcer. In fact, uh, he belonged also to the Ware and Perlow spy rings. And I think it's time for the uh, lazy uh, grand jury and the Sentinel, who is, has recently been bought out. There's a good article by uh, in Bruce Bratton's uh, uh, series, but uh, this county does not represent the people, and it shows just by, we've got Californians running and fleeing from fires, yet they're going to send a fire truck uh, to Central America while their fellow citizens burn. Thank you. Thank you. Tough act to follow, but good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lauren, and I'm from Scotts Valley. Supervisor McPherson. I'm addressing you today about your persistent, inflammatory, and divisive statements regarding the select committees of South Bay Arrival's supermajority recommendation to return to the historic Big Sur flight path. You have needlessly been alarming the public by saying things like, it would just be a disaster if it moved back, or it will just be moving noise. As a member of that committee, you know full well that the FAA, our congressional representatives, save our skies, Santa Cruz, quiet skies, NorCal, your fellow supervisor, John Leopold, who put forth the proposal, and all of us affected by the surfer flight path, 
are doing everything in our power to make sure that the Big Sur overlay is as quiet or quieter than it was before when it received only one noise complaint from our area in the year before it was moved. It is in everybody's best interest to make this transition successful and the select committee process a model for communities across the nation. But your failure to communicate that intent fosters fear and division among the people you were elected to represent. Your efforts to keep the surfer path moved over people who had no warning or voice in that decision basically endorses the idea that a flight path can be moved anytime and anywhere with no due process. And under that way of thinking, no community is safe from what we have endured. Please join us. Help make this work, make it better than it was before. Make this a proud accomplishment in your long and impressive career and not a sad footnote in the memory of a community that felt you let them down. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tony Crane. I'm representing a neighborhood in Aptos. Um, I'm here to formally and publicly protest uh, what we consider an egregious abuse of public trust um, in the implementation of the second story program in our neighborhood uh, and the placement of a facility in that neighborhood. Uh, I want to make it clear that I'm not here to protest the program itself. Uh, it serves uh, a needy community. Uh, however, uh, I am here to protest um, the unethical and uh, incompetent process by which the facility was chosen. Um, uh, we've provided irrefutable evidence of this. Uh, uh, Supervisor Friend is in receipt of some of the information that we have. Um, and so I'm hoping that all of you are aware of what's gone on. I mean, that was our way of trying to bring it to the board uh, in advance. Um, but uh, it's irrefutable evidence of a calculated plan to misrepresent the intent and scope of the facility, uh, given absolute misrepresentations of the truth uh, to the public um, in order to uh, circumvent the process that needed to be handled, a public hearing, um, you know, mitigated negative declarations, all those things that are associated with putting a commercial facility um, in any area, at, let alone a residential area. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping, again, that you guys have received that information and that you're taking it very seriously because there are, we are alleging serious violations of the public trust, um, certainly unethical, possibly illegal, um, that's to be determined, but uh, I just hope that you guys do understand that um, we're, we're serious about this um, and that you will get the information from uh, Mr. Friend or I can provide it to each of you so that you can make an informed decision on what is to happen with this facility in the future. Uh, they've recently just requested a change to the uh, description of the program to fit it in under the misrepresentations that have been put forth to the public, uh, but it has allowed them to begin operations by misrepresenting things. They've actually misrepresented information to the county, uh, to county planning, and uh, so um, it, it, this is a, a pretty serious issue. Um, so again, I hope that you do take it seriously and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, uh, Mr. Del Conte. Uh, uh, glad to have you back up here. You bet. Um, as I said, this is kind of the last place I want to be today, but um, the workers and the middle managers have asked me to come and just say a word and try to get uh, some straightness on on their pride and what they do on the on the properties. Um, you may know that we have uh, had filed an appeal. We have no 
they want me to go through with that, I don't want to, and I think that would be futile, so we're not gonna go through with the appeal, so that's something you may need to know. But they did want me to come and express um, some of the pictures that were thrown up are from years ago. Um, they realized that they're not a, a perfect bunch, but the workers that work in this, in, in this region and the people of this community that work on the landfill on behalf of the recycling facilities are extraordinary individuals. They're, they're great people. Um, they have a, um, a lot of pride. They were offended at uh, some of the pictures. They felt that, um, you know, over 12 years, cherry picking pictures from long ago to put up. Some of them were more recent and they recognize that, they take responsibility. They, they wish or we wish that there would have been more than a minute to explain some of those items, but uh, nonetheless, they are what they are. But I just wanna speak on behalf of the, the extraordinary people that are in production and middle management that you have working and we're forwarding those to Keith Day, those individuals, all of them, we're making all of those available. But um, you know, they felt that, uh, let me make sure I'm not missing anything from my notes. Um, uh, they're a great group of conscientious people, fortunate to have them here. I've been fortunate enough to work with them. Um, I'll take credit for finding them, selecting them, but uh, that's about it. Um, the um, David, um, we have a David that works up at uh, Ben Loman and another David that works out at um, um, uh, Buena Vista. They're very, they have a lot of pride in what they do. Um, and uh, um, the safety record is bared out, is borne by the uh, state of California at, that has to do with um, the workers' comp. Our, their safety record, our safety record is 29% better than the industry average. And just, they just wanted to point that out. And I wanted to point some of that out as well, but I wouldn't be here if it was just me. They, they asked me to come. Um, so please don't believe all the things that you saw. Um, come and see them. David and David have asked me to ask you, come see the facility before they close it down. And they'll, we'll close it down nicely. But it is a good facility and something that you should be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, uh, members of the board. I'm here to comment on an item on the written correspondence list. I believe I'm in the right place. Uh, my name is David Brody. I'm the executive director of First Five Santa Cruz County. I'm here this morning to thank the board, and in particular, Chair Leopold, uh, for issuing the proclamation declaring January 2018 Positive Parenting Awareness Month. Uh, this proclamation, as well as recent actions of this board, taken as early as this morning, demonstrate that our county and each of you fully understands the incredibly important role of parenting and caregiving and what it plays and how it plays in supporting not just the well-being of our children, but our entire community. It's for that reason that we are incredibly proud at First Five to serve as the backbone organization of the Triple P Positive Parenting Program, uh, an international evidence-based program that with funding from First Five as well as the county through your health services agency has helped literally thousands of parents improve their parenting practices, reduce their stress and anxiety, and most importantly, build positive, healthy relationship with their kids, which I know each one of you can very much appreciate. Um, this board will remember that uh, about a year ago, First Five issued a five-year report on the Triple P program, and just as a refresher, I've brought executive summaries uh, for your perusal uh, in your free time. We like to always remind folks of the important work that we're doing together. Um, Combined with other parenting programs uh, and supports in this county, like the Parent Leadership Committee in Live Oak, an organic formation of parent leaders, to the array of home visiting programs that we have brought to bear in no small part because of the work of this board, um, our county has created in Santa Cruz an environment for parents that doesn't just talk the talk, but literally walks the walk. And we are greatly appreciative to all of you for that. On behalf of the First Five Santa Cruz County Commission, I ask that you of course maintain that appropriate focus on the importance of positive parenting and that you once again, and thank you for once again recognizing January 2018 as Positive Parenting Awareness Month. Thank you very much. Thank you and thank you for all your work and your partnership. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos Hills. I have an, a request I'll make again, and it's a very simple one, that your board have the binder of supporting materials for issues you're discussing here. 
in the back of the room. There's now a sign saying you can go to the the board's, uh, clerk of the board's office and get them. But then you have to leave the room and you don't hear what's being said at a time when you wanna hear what's being said. It's a simple thing, just move the binder of materials that support what you're talking about and what the public needs to be informed about here so we can read last minute things, please. I want to uh, let you know that I attended the recent um, scoping, CEQA scoping session at UCSC regarding their proposed uh, Student Housing West project. I was appalled to see that there were only four members of the public there. It was very difficult to find. I always get lost at UCSC. There were no signs. and. Um, I really would like to ask this board to reach out to UCSC to do better outreach within the community, um, have community meetings for their scoping meetings for whatever the next step in the CEQA process is, have them in uh, within the community, not just up at UCSC. And there were no students there either. Um, my next issue is discussion about what I saw as a very odd parliamentary procedure during last week's hosted rental. I have never seen that there are two motions allowed on the floor at the same time. I have never seen that the second motion introduced is voted on first and is allowed to kill the first motion. I know your board uses a different set of rules, not Robert's rules, and I couldn't remember what they were to look them up, but I would like some explanation of that. I also want to uh, point out that uh, following Mr. Del Conte's um, discussion with you, that Vision Recycling's bid was lowest. It was the lowest bid by $211,000. Public Works Director Mr. Presley has told me when contracts were taken for the Aptos Village project, they had to take the San Luis Obispo contractor because the county has to take the lowest bid. But that isn't what happened with Vision Recycling and Keith Day. And I think it was pretty interesting that the county public works staff delayed making a decision before your board until the 11th hour, when you could no longer kick the can down the road. And I also think it's interesting that after your August meeting and request for a second RFP, County Public Works started visiting intensely the, Thank you. the facility and writing up the Thank very you. smallest things. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Marilyn Garrett, part of Wireless Radiation Alert Network. I am very appreciative for people who come and speak at this meeting, and I would encourage people who are watching this to do the same, because I think all of you need to see and hear from the public directly. I especially um, am grateful to Becky Steinbrunner and all the work she does to try to make the community a better place. and you would do well to act on her suggestions, very well to do that on behalf of the public. It's disappointing to me that I rarely see that. I saw a new documentary called, just, it's just out, Generation Zapped, and it's about exposure of children and many of you here, most of you sitting here have young children or young adult children. It, in the film, they interview people who are medical professionals and they show the harm to children and what happens to the fetus, what happens to young people with microwave radiation exposure, damage to the DNA, the thought processes, there are a list of symptoms. I recommend the film. I read also a new book this year, The Invisible Rainbow, History of Electricity and Life. And I was thinking of that book this morning and I've gone back to it. There's a chapter called The Irritable Heart. One of the symptoms 
also listed on this graph that you have received neurobehavior symptoms near cell towers, uh, the radiation from the radiation fatigue, sleep disturbances, et cetera. One of them is cardiovascular problem. And what we're seeing is heart strokes and heart attacks in younger and younger people. The signaling of the heart is interfered with and the microcirculation I've showed you, I'm not a medical professional, a retired elementary school teacher, but I can understand the basics and read about them. The blood cell abnormalities affect the circulation related to the uh, heart arrhythmia and strokes. And I just heard on the news today that when, you know, it's like so many heart attacks and don't know all the causes, but this is one. Thank you. That Ed Lee, the mayor of San Francisco, died unexpectedly of a heart Thank attack you. today. Is there anyone else who'd like to address us? Good morning. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. It's been a while. Uh, I'm Michael Duffy from 2613 Monterey Avenue in SoCal. And uh, lived there all my life, basically. And, uh, and now my neighbor at 2611. Could you use the microphone so everybody could hear you? Oh, okay. Now with the, the 2611, which my neighbors, which was my grandparents' home, have decided that they want to build a fence. You know that song, Don't Fence Me In? Well, I've got land, not much land, just an acre and a half. Don't fence me in, but it's, it's too late because my neighbor has been building a fence right along my driveway. So I can't, uh, you can't go out my f front driveway without seeing a fence that surrounds my property, which ruins my, my view, and also it encroaches upon the creek, which is a repairing corridor. So I can't get to the repairing corridor now because there's a fence there. You know, when you're walking on your, on your property that's been your property for a long time and all of a sudden there's a fence there because some people who bought the property think it's okay to just go ahead and build willy-nilly. It's ridiculous. Also, a couple other things in the area. There's a, 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 a huge trailer, which is on a, a, the property at a, kind of off of a, where the, where the park is. There's a, a couple parks around, but there's one is a, is a huge, trailer that just was dumped and it's along a repairing corridor too. When you go along that repairing corridor, it's all around SoCal and around, especially around the area around the, where the, the parks are, it's just getting ridiculous. I, I don't know how to do, you know, whether, whether I'm supposed to spend millions of dollars to, to get a bunch of lawyers to, to come and, and say, no, this is his property and, and, and you, you can't build there or, and it is not only that, it, not only is it, is, it, is it private property, but it's, it's, a, it's an area of, of parks and everything. I, I'm really confused. I've been confused over the years. And, and, and now it's, a, it, it's really confusing when it's, they're right on the property line. I don't know whether you could get the sheriffs involved in it or so, so and, and figure out whether it's, a, whether it's a local issue or whether it's a, uh, a state issue or government. I don't know exactly how, how big the issues go or exactly how they all wander around, but I would appreciate getting some feedback instead of we'll be getting to it. You know, I'd like to get some feedback about actually what's actually happening. To, so I'll give the exact addresses 2613 and 2611 Monterey Avenue, SoCal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us in oral communications? Seeing none, we'll go to our regular agenda. Our first item is item 57, which is consider report and recommendations for a revenue agreement with the State Department of Healthcare Services for, for provision of drug Medi-Cal services expansion and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Health Services Agency Director Included as an attachment to the implementation plan for drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system. There's a revenue contract 18R0574, Amendment 1, 
DHCS for DMC ODS. There's the ADM 29 amendment for the 18R0574 state DHCS. And there's the AUD 60 resolution. I see we have staff up here, and maybe they'll explain to us what all those numbers and letters mean. But uh, good morning and uh, welcome. Good morning, Chairman and members of the board. I'm Jane Nguyen, Director from the Health Services Agency. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, to consider this very important item to our county. Uh, with me this morning, we have uh, our Director of Behavior Health, Eric Riera, and our Drug and Alcohol Administrator, um, Ms. Shana Zura. Um, they will join me to provide your board with a brief presentation regarding this uh, drug medical organized delivery services system um, expansion for our county. Uh, first, I will start with uh, acknowledgement and thanking your board for your leadership uh, throughout the year to support us with this uh, very important item. As you recall, last year you authorized for our agency to explore this option to work, continue working with the state uh, to review our implementation plan and to come up with a financial model um, to, to ensure sustainability and to expand um, Medi -Cal, drug Medi-Cal services for our community. So our staff, um, under the leadership of Mr. Rivera and uh, Ms. Shana Zura, who's a welcome addition to the team, we work really hard with the State Department of Healthcare Services to negotiate um, state general funds contribution and also other necessary items to ensure that we have a reasonable contract uh, with the state and the feds for our sustainability to expand drug medical services for the residents of Santa Cruz County. So I want to thank um, Eric and his staff, uh, Shana. I also would like to thank all the contractor providers that have worked very closely with us throughout the last few years um, to uh, receive training, necessary training to roll out this implementation. Our alcohol and drug commissioners, who are a big part of what we do uh, for drug medical services here. Um, all of the stakeholders, um, all the county departments uh, have been involved helping us with this project, especially the probation department and the Department of Human Services who also contribute financially to the budget of this drug medical expansion, and our partner in criminal justice systems as well. So with that, I will hand it over to uh, Mr. Herrera and Ms. Zura for the presentation, and we'll try to make it quick. Our board letter is rather lengthy because we want to make sure that you have enough information, and we'll try not to repeat the information of the presentation today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. I'd just like to provide a couple of introductory comments. Again, I want to express my appreciation to the board, to Jane and her staff, as well as to Shana and her staff, who have been working tirelessly over the last couple of years to move this project forward. We've been engaged in, in very long negotiations with the state and with the federal government around the implementation of this program. And over the last couple of years, I've experienced a number of delays, um, one of which was due to negotiations around funding, um, particularly future funding for the program, and then new requirements that the state and federal government put on the county in terms of our implementation plan and new requirements that we had to meet. So I'm, I'm very happy that we're at this point. Um, it gives us a unique opportunity to expand these services in the community, which is a critical need that's been identified for a long time. So again, my appreciation to everyone involved in this project. I think, I think we have a, a very positive opportunity here before us today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shana, who's going to go over a brief presentation for the board. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for the opportunity to deliver this information to you. So I'm just going to walk you through it. You might want to make sure that your microphone is on. Is the green light at the bottom pushed? Yeah, it seems to be. Yeah, is that better? Yeah, you, you, if you can get closer to the microphone, people will definitely hear you. How's that? Great. Perfect. Good morning. Um, so I wanted to just take a few minutes to walk you through the overview of our drug medical delivery system. Um, so DMC ODS, Drug Medical Organized Delivery System, is defined as a pilot program to test a new paradigm for the organized delivery of healthcare services for Medicaid eligible individuals with substance use disorder. So what this does is it opens up the opportunity for anybody who has Medi-Cal and has a substance use disorder that meets medical criteria to get expanded service access. Um, 
The DMC ODS is defined as a continuum of care model utilizing the ASAM criteria, the American Society of Addiction Medicine. It provides increased administrative oversight to our system. It also improves care and efficiency through additional utilization controls in partnership with the state. Um, it does require the use of evidence-based interventions, which many of our providers are well-versed in and already providing, but it will expand that opportunity, um, and increase coordination with other health systems. So we're assuring that we're providing holistic care to each and every individual with a substance use disorder in our community. Uh, California is the first state to gain federal approval for service expansion under the Drug Medi-Cal 2020 waiver. Um, and each county has been invited by the state to consider participation and opt into this program. Um, 40 counties have submitted programmatic and fiscal implementation plans. As of December 1st, only seven counties have signed an agreement with the state, um, so we are in the beginning waves of this process. Uh, the program does become an entitlement, so we want to make sure the board is aware of that in terms of just potential risks in opting in. Um, our budget, which is currently having a deficit in year two of about $1 million, is based on approximately an 100% uh, increase in client serves. So we want to double the folks that we're serving. Um, and that deficit increase or decreases if that projection is higher or lower um, and uh, is potentially impacted by changes on a federal level. Um, in front of you, you have a continuum of care model, which sort of exemplifies how folks can move through the system. Um, we offer early intervention as well as two levels of outpatient services, um, outpatient and intensive outpatient services, which are similar in service delivery but different in dosage. So folks who need more intensive care would go into the intensive model. And then we also have uh, our residential services, which in the drug medical model are really used as crisis stabilization for folks who are in imminent danger. The understanding is that utilizing the ASAM assessment along the way, we can stay continually in tune with where the person is and what their specific needs are and move them into either higher or lower care depending on their needs at that given time. Um, so the American Society of Addiction Medicine criteria provides us guidance for both the beneficiary as well as the provider. So the beneficiary in coming into the system has an initial assessment where we determine what their need is and we place them with a provider. The providers have also gone through drug medical certification processes, which is quite rigorous, and have been determined to uh, be appropriate to provide various levels of care so that we make sure that we're matching appropriately the individual with the provider that can best serve them. Um, so as I said, the assessment culminates in a matching between the beneficiary's individual need and the level of care offered by that provider. Um, and the beneficiary is reassessed throughout the treatment episode, so we're not necessarily just placing them and saying you're going to do X number of prescribed days of treatment, but uh, on a weekly basis, the provider will be continually reassessing that person to assure that they're still meeting their level of care need, and if they're not meeting that need, to move them to higher or lower care appropriately. Um, it also provides us some specific uh, array services, including early intervention and prevention. Uh, we will have outpatient and intensive outpatient treatment, some expansion in residential treatment, um, narcotic treatment programs, uh, withdrawal management, which is formerly known as detox services, uh, physician consultation, case management, recovery services, and 24-hour access to treatment resources. So it is a full spectrum. Um, we will be able to expand our service capacity significantly in Santa Cruz by opting into the waiver. Um, it will improve our quality of service through those administrative oversights. Uh, we will provide expansion of medication-assisted treatment for folks particularly struggling with the opioid disorder that is uh, currently an epidemic. Um, we will have more integrated care in which the providers are communicating with each other in, in new ways and making sure that they're working as a, a coordinated network. And uh, it also is in support of the strategic plan that has been adopted by the board. Um, it gives us the opportunity to renegotiate rates with our service providers to assure that they have the, um, the necessary resources to meet this increased level of rigor in our system. Um, again, it shares best practice integration, uh, stronger collaborations across our provider network, really coming to the table and working together um, regardless of what provider that person has initially accessed care through, um, and it increases our accountability to the state through those oversights. We have built the system so that there are three primary gates, three ways that folks in our community can access 
services. One is through our HSA access team, which historically has primarily focused on mental health services, but will be expanding with Drug Medi-Cal to be the uh, county primary gate to substance use disorder services. Each of our providers will also serve as a gate so that anybody who's in need of services can come to the access team or can go directly to the provider who can then assess them and either provide them the level of care or if they don't offer that level of care, refer them somewhere else in the network to get that care. Um, and then we also have the HSA service coordinators who are um, brokering those referral processes primarily through our partners with criminal justice and uh, child welfare services. So in phase one network expansion, there's a chart in front of you. Our three providers that are currently DMC certified and ready to go January 1 with implementation are Janus, Encompass, and Sobriety Works. And you can see here that Janus has some residential expansion in the works. Um, Encompass is also looking at the potential for expanded residential services, and um, all of the providers can expand greatly with their intensive outpatient and outpatient services uh, to expand with the need without a prescribed cap. Um, and we have two providers, PVPSA and New Life, who are working on drug medical applications who would like to opt into the network with us, which will expand our ability for services. Um, and you can see in front of you that there are numbers for expansion as well. All in all, um, our current capacity is 87 residential beds and 178 outpatient slots throughout the county. In phase one, we'll be able to increase to 103 residential beds, and we do not have a cap on outpatient slots, so the number of people that come in needing services is the number of folks that we can provide services for. And in phase two, with onboarding uh, New Life, we will have 141 <coughs> residential beds that are available to the community through drug medical services um, and no cap on outpatient slots. So we're looking at a significant expansion. Um, all in all, I think that there are some incredible benefits to our community and, and hope that you have all of your questions answered. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'll see if members of uh, the board have any questions. Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. <clears throat> well, first, thank you for your work. You've had to run a gauntlet of, uh, of federal and state uh, processing requirements, and I appreciate it. And clearly this is a huge need in our community and um, can be a real benefit. My, one of my questions came from the fact that with only seven counties participating and people can transfer their Medi-Cal or you know, uh, come here and sign up for Medi-Cal, how do we, um, how are we concerned about impact from out-of-county folks coming here and using up these, these very precious slots mm -hmm. and capacity? Yes, um, that's a very valid question. Thank you for asking. So under the state's rule, um, counties who accepted a contract with the state um, have would have options to serve out of, out of county uh, Medi-Cal beneficiary. Uh, we uh, could either serve those clients through our contractor providers, or we would uh, return those um, people back to their county of origin. Um, due to um, the limited um, size of our county, and this is a a new initiative to expand services, we realize that our capacity is very limited. We want us to be very successful. We want to focus our service for the residents of Santa Cruz County at this time only. So our um, approach would be con to contact those uh, counties where those people come from to, co to return them back to their county and refer them back to their county of origin for services. So if they wanted to transfer their Medi-Cal to this county, we could we have an ability to say no, and and if and if they arrive here and they're not signed up for Medi-Cal and want to sign up for Medi-Cal, do we have an ability to to see how long they've been here or to to establish to figure out some sort of way to establish residency? Um, HSA is not does not have the authority to sign up or not sign up people for Medi-Cal. That would be HSD responsibility. But I think um, under the rules, anyone uh, who like to reside in our county, they would have the ability to apply for it, and it's it's the county's process to to go through to determine eligibility. Okay, and is there is there a local preference that we can we can use in that process? 
Um, because our department is not in charge of Medi-Cal eligibility, right. so I cannot answer that question because I don't understand the rules very well. We have to be careful with federal and state rules on Medi-Cal eligibility. Okay. One thing that I can add is if a beneficiary has Medi-Cal services in another county and wishes to transfer them in, it's quite a complex and rigorous process and it takes a long time. Um, we're looking at a minimum of 60 to 90 days. And so often the person will be better served if we were to get in touch with their county of origin and talk to them about potential resources that they would be matched with services quicker uh, going that route than to try to transfer their, their Medi-Cal into Santa Cruz County. Okay, great. Other questions? Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I just want to say congratulations. Um, this has been um, a missing link for substance abuse treatment that we've needed to address uh, for Medi-Cal patients for a long, long time. And I know it's taken a lot of work, as you've mentioned. I just want to say congratulations. Congratulations. I think this has been the biggest missing piece um, for our services to the homeless and the frequent offenders that uh, we hear about day in and day out, week in and week out. Um, and I think that um, their chronic, we, we need to address their chronic um, intoxication in public or other minor offenses that they might have. Um, but just as long as the treatment is readily available and that in essence county residents have priority, I think um, it's, a, it's gonna be a very, very positive program for Santa Cruz County. Okay, uh, I, I just had a couple questions that I wanted to ask. Um, in the, uh, uh, the cover letter the, um, to this, um, it, it points out that if the courts ordered a person to a 90-day residential treatment and that person does not meet ASAM criteria, then residential service providers would not be able to claim and receive federal funds, thus they might decline accepting that person. Uh, HSA staff met with relevant county departments in the court to provide information regarding the state's requirement for the DMC ODS program. What does that mean? So what that means is that anybody going into a residential service under drug medical needs to meet medical necessity. And uh, that may or may not be true for someone who is uh, looking at criminal justice issues. So what that means is that we would assess that person and determine whether they would meet drug medical eligibility for residential services. And we've had a number of conversations just in the past few weeks with our criminal justice partners about how we're gonna manage this. Um, there are sort of twofold um, concerns. One is folks that are currently incarcerated that have a mandate, um, and then there's folks that come down the pike and how we're going to work with our criminal justice par partners around that. In terms of the folks that are currently mandated and are in custody, um, we dug into those numbers. There's actually quite few. There's only three right now, um, folks that are in custody that are mandated to treatment. And so what we're doing is we're working with our partners around other funding stream opportunities, um, such as AB 109, for example, to pay for those treatment stays for those folks that are kind of caught in the middle of our transition and then on an ongoing basis uh, working collaboratively, collaboratively with the court systems with the district attorney and public defender's office to determine how we're going to meet both the needs of the community in regards to that as well as work within the confines of the drug medical system okay th thank you I appreciate that I mean I think it's a really important uh, piece uh, I think that the the board member uh, both uh, I th the, the the one category in the letter that said excitement with precautions um, <laughs> is probably the way I, I feel. I think this is very exciting, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's uh, we know that the substance use disorder problem in our community is great. Um, we've uh, we've done a number of different things to um, uh, to try to make it better. We hear from constituents uh, about these concerns, and they manifest themselves uh, um, in public. In, um, in ways that are really challenging for the community. So I'm really glad that we have this new program. And I also understand it, it costs uh, a lot of money. I, I, I note that when the president uh, uh, commission on opioids said declare a national emergency, the, the president stopped short of declaring something that would actually provide more funding. Um, and that just, just shows you something about um, uh, compassion. Um, is to acknowledge a problem but not provide resources uh, is, not, um, is not an effective way of declaring that the, that the nation has a problem. You uh, made sure to uh, make it clear to us that this is a new entitlement program. Um, and the document points out that 
Uh, this is federally approved until December 2020. So, um, you know, the, the, the healthcare land, landscape at the federal level is still changing after a year of, uh, of a real attacks. We don't know what's gonna happen with the tax bill. Um, uh, their failure to pass children's health insurance program is not a great sign for thinking that there's a, a, an even reasonable view of healthcare at, at the national level. Let's say this federal support goes away. What is the, what will be our responsibilities for entitlement after December 2020, mm -hmm. if the if the federal government ha has withdrawn support? Thank you for that question. <clears throat> uh, also, it is um, the concern of uh, counties that are, have signed the contract with the state. So um, I actually asked this question at the most recent CSAC meeting to the director of the health, uh, state health care services agency. Um, she recognized the unpredictability um, issue going on at the federal level right now. However, the state has a strong commitment to request the feds for a renewal of the waiver um, beyond um, 2020. And uh, speaking with her in private and her staff in private, they basically say they would ask for a one year extension pending um, who might be the next president or so, so that they can negotiate a better deal. Um, at this point, um, we have a plan if we uh, do not receive federal funding or state, uh, state general funds for this contract beyond 2020, we would work with our community providers and with all the stakeholders to decide how to bring recommendation to your board um, to ensure sustainability and not impacting um, the residents of this county. So it's, it's still unpredictable. Uh, but we do have a plan that we can get out of it. Uh, that's why we need to launch this carefully and not uh, totally expand it to the point that uh, if there's no additional funding or adequate funding, we could have a way to um, mitigate the impact. So I don't have a definite answer for you, uh, Supervisor, but uh, we do this with a lot of precautions. And that's why, as, as you notice, there are only seven counties at this time have signed up for this contract. But I was told recently at the last state meeting that there are other 22 counties already to sign up by the end of this new calendar year coming up. So I think there's hope for additional counties coming on board. Yeah, uh, the, I just wanted to ask one last question about that. You said that we're part of this first wave um, there's gonna, th but you also talked about 40 other counties looking to do it. Um, and is the expectation that all 58 are gonna do it or um, is, uh, will most of the counties do it? So to be clear, the seven is inclusive in that 40, so it's 40 total. Yeah. Um, the uh, counties that have submitted plans, they had a deadline uh, with the state saying, if you intend to opt into this, you must submit and have approved both your implementation and fiscal plans. And those counties all went through that process. Those um, 40. Yes, correct. And have approved plans with the state so they have clearance to go forward with it. Um, and my understanding is that you know many counties are sort of watching the counties that have already gone live to make sure that they do their due diligence in uh, creating a plan that's going to be successful. Um, but I anticipate that yes, as Jane said, many of those counties are intending to opt in. Great. Well, I think the, the help in increasing capacity. I see some of our our partners here in the audience. Uh, it's going to be really critical uh, because we know the need is great, and we know the number of people who say that they're ready for treatment is great, and our resources right now do not meet that need. And so, the closer we can come to having treatment on demand, the more successful we'll be about um, about um, helping people. Um, overcome substance use disorder. Sure, um, I just have one last uh, question. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, so, yeah um, this projected annual budget is over $22 million. Um, I have, what's, do you have any idea about what the total cost, uh, we, how much we spend on substance abuse directing uh, year in, year out, and I know this would include the human uh, care services and so forth, and uh, probation department, is there any estimate of how much we spend as a county on so that? So currently our annual budget for substance use disorder um, in uh, Mr. Rivera's budget is about 6.8 or $9 million per year. So we're gonna go from 6.9 to 22.4. Uh, and most of it has to do with federal funding uh, that we would be able to draw down as reimbursement. So we have to provide services, claim it, in order to draw down federal funding, and it requires a match, a local match. 
And the way we come up with the local match is, of course, net county cost. And um, any uh, uh, non-federal funding, including uh, AB 109 from the probation department, and HSD CalWORKs uh, dollars amount for substance use disorder, and our uh, 2011 health realignment funds that we receive uh, from the state through sales tax and vehicle license fees. So we're going from $7 million to $22 million a year. Uh, this is a huge expansion, and most of it is uh, federal funding. And it requires a lot of leveraging, and also require cost reporting, cost settlement up to five years after each uh, fiscal year of services that were provided. So it's a lot of work. Um, now I'll open it up for members of the public who might want to comment on this. Please come forward. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Fish Williams. I represent PVPSA, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. We do support the county's uh, request to go forward with the drug Medi-Cal. We see this as a viable way to continue funding and ensure services in uh, the South County, especially for the communities that we serve. This is especially true given the uh, nature of the medical or marijuana becoming recreational access coming in January. We're anticipating a greater influx of need for services. So we support this and uh, we appreciate your support as well. And together we can uh, change lives. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Leopold. Fernando Geraldo, Chief Probation Officer of Santa Cruz County. I just want to say a few words about the possibilities of the uh, drug Medi-Cal waiver and expansion. Um, when we first heard about this at the Probation Department, we were pretty excited about the prospects, enthusiastic about um, how many more people we could serve. We know that uh, 65% uh, or more um, of our individuals on probation suffer from uh, some form of substance use disorder. Um, and as we know, um, addiction uh, does drive criminal behavior. So for us, it's really about public safety. Um, I think uh, being able to enroll folks in the appropriate level of care, um, as, we, as was mentioned, this is an evidence-based uh, response using uh, a risk assessment, uh, matching folks with uh, the, the appropriate level and dosage. It's precisely what uh, I think will work. So um, we know there's going to be challenges. We've talked about a few, but we've met uh, a lot of challenges in the last uh, decade of the changes that we've taken place in uh, California. So I, I, um, I think this is, uh, this is very promising for not just the probation population, but our entire community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I had the same question that you, Supervisor Leopold, Supervisor McPherson, brought up about the large expense to the county, approximately 22 million a year, and the unsteady situation with federal funding as you uh, elaborated upon, it's very pertinent here. So this to me seems quite risky uh, in terms of county funding and also the amount of people uh, served. Um, I often think if we had um, health care, Medicare for all, uh, we would have a lot better health care system without having to do what seems to me this kind of Band-Aid approach to gushing wounds in health care. I am aware that approximately 100,000 deaths a year are because of doctor-prescribed drugs, medications used as directed, and this Previous gentleman who spoke talked about adjusting dosage and all. It sounds like the program, and I have a question for you when I finish here, is uh, treating drugs with drugs. And I also think a lot of the drug problems, health problems, are embedded in our inequitable economic system where there's massive unemployment, a lot of poverty that we shouldn't have, and that's related to um, various problems. I was also um, 
kind of dismayed that I think it said that um, tobacco addiction is not part of this, and that's that's a big problem. And then there's a an addiction that's not addressed. <laughs> you know what? Cell phone addiction. People are constantly going into entrainment on their phones all the time. There's a health uh, ailment called digital dementia, and a lot of children are experiencing it. It seems to me one of the largest areas of addiction uh, to the cell phone radiation is not omitted here. And the last point, and I want to ask you this, it wasn't clear to me, I'd like to see instead of a drug, drug with drugs problem is that there be, whole, use the word holistic care, but I'd like that elaborated upon because there's great benefit Thank to you. acupuncture, homeopathy, naturopathy. It's, Thank you. Could you respond to that, please? What well, part well, of We this? will hear the testimony and then we will uh, answer questions. Good morning, Supervisors. Uh, Rudy Escalante with Janice of Santa Cruz. I just want to commend uh, HSA staff for all the hard work that they've been putting in, working with the stakeholders, holding several meetings, working through the process to understand how this is all going to work out. We're very supportive of the Medi-Cal expansion. We received a grant to expand from 24 beds to 40 beds at our facility, thanks to the California Alliance. So I think there's really strong partnerships in Santa Cruz County. There is a huge need. As you saw, the bed space, if you think about the population that we have here and the amount of beds that we have, the resources are extremely limited and we haven't even really talked about our youth, uh, those under the age of 18. So there is a growing need for it. I think there are going to be some challenges. We've all admitted that. But I think we're committed to working together to try and get over these challenges and uh, some of the unknown uh, potholes that exist out there uh, from this expansion. But I think it's a great opportunity for our uh, clients and for uh, our community, so thank you. Thank you and thank you for your work. Good morning. Good morning, Supervisors. Kate Welty, Chief Programs Officer in Compass Community Services. I also want to say congratulations to our partners for the Herculean task that you have undergone um, in bringing this to our community, and we want to express our full support. It will allow us at Encompass to um, expand service provision. We are working on a, an expansion of our Cisa Puede campus, and this will allow the treatment funding um, to bring that from a 23-bed facility to a 40-bed facility. Um, which will be fantastic. Um, as, uh, as Chief uh, Her um, Fernando said, it is an incredible opportunity to be more strategic about how we're using our treatment dollars. The assessments allow us to ensure that we are looking at acuity and we are placing people where they will be most successfully treated. That means greater health for the community. It also allows us to um, continue to do something that we strongly believe in, which is operate um, in community and in partnership to have community impact. This is an issue that we know affects our entire community, as Supervisor Leopold, you were saying earlier. Working together in a more strategic manner is going to allow us to use these resources um, to their best impact um, and with evidence-based practices and in a collaborative effort. And we just feel very, very strongly that this is exactly what this community needs to address substance use disorder. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, board. Ellen Timberlake, Director of the Human Services Department. I just want to echo our wholehearted, wholehearted support for this expansion. Really want to thank uh, Director Wynn and her team for the efforts that you've put forth to expand this service in our community. Um, on behalf of our department, uh, similar to Fernando, many of our clients and participants in services uh, need these services desperately, and we've always been very appreciative of the service support that we've gotten from the Health Services Agency and their partners. So we are thrilled with this expansion and very happy to be a contributor um, to the process. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. 
Good morning, Nicole Cato on behalf of Sobriety Works. And I wanted to start by thanking HSA and all the effort you guys have put in. It really means a lot to the service coordinators. They've given us a great opportunity to work on collaboration amongst the service providers so that we can really provide a network of care for all the individuals in Santa Cruz County. And I know that the number $22 million seems like a huge amount, but in 2014 when we looked into the statistics, it was $208 million that the county spent on medical beds and jail beds and ER costs. And so by expanding these services, we can drop that $208 million down, reinvest it into our community and neighborhoods and healing Santa Cruz County, which is really what we all want to do. And we will be able to focus on these clients and be able to give them that medical care that they need um, through the criteria. And it's really great to be able to expand these services and truly, truly serve the clients who need it the most in this county. And I know you all really want to benefit everyone who really needs it. And it's really exciting to be able to live in a community who's opening their arms and their hearts to the people who really need it the most. So thank you all. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my name's Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of the Aptos Hills, and I've read through not all of the documentation, but as much as I could, and um, it, it does seem like a lot of money. <laughs> and, and what worries me is the entitlement, that the risk that the county's taking on with an unknown level of reimbursement for residential treatment. I also, um, in talking with the resident that spoke before you about what's going on in the estates neighborhood in Aptos regarding uh, sort of a different treatment, but a, again, a residential treatment facility nonetheless, um, that process has been completely clouded to the public. And I have concerns about these, uh, maybe a proliferation of these residential treatment centers springing up in our residential areas about staff not being forthcoming, about what's really going on. And um, the public is completely left in the dark about what is going on and uh, not fairly represented to any state or federal agencies that are providing funding. So I wanna make sure if this occurs regarding this pathway of treatment that any residential areas affected are early on brought into the process, are uh, given full factual, factual information, and um, are, are truly in support of what it could do with their neighborhood. I applaud um, this treatment process. Um, I also question the county's proliferation of permits for wine bars and brew pubs on pretty much every corner. It's almost like Starbucks was a little bit ago. It's making uh, alcohol consumption a trendy thing to do. And I don't think it's healthy for our society even though it's a good tax base for our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to our board uh, for discussion or action. I guess I, I will uh, move approval uh, of the recommended action and then I'll have a c comments, assuming there's a second. Okay. Second. Motion by Coonerty, seconded by Friend. So I just wanna say, I, I understand there's a risk, but there's also a risk in not doing anything and you see the need every day and you see families and individuals struggling and you see the impacts on the community. And um, I just wanna take a moment to, to recognize uh, Director Wynn and her HSA team because uh, for so long, I think we've all felt like our healthcare system waited until the severity had reached a, a, the highest possible point. Uh, this is the way our national system is set up, uh, so that we're paying enormous costs on the back end after people have uh, suffered, after families have suffered, and after there have been tremendous impacts to the community. And through this program and a bunch of other programs, I actually feel like we're moving towards a health-based system where we're recognizing that if we can intervene with the appropriate treatment at the appropriate time, um, we can serve people better, which seems common sense, but unfortunately is, uh, takes an enormous amount of innovation and real leadership um, in order to make that happen. And, and so through your efforts today, this is a major, is a major step to move forward and to, to improve the health of the community. Uh, and so I wanna thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. All right, other comments, Supervisor McPherson. I, and just in um, response to the, one of the last speakers about 
The, the amount of over $200 million spent on medical beds and jail beds and so forth um, uh, that are attributed to substance use disorder, is there any way that we can, uh, um, we can track that putting this program in place had an impact on that, uh, those jail beds or medical facilities so we can see this costs us a lot, but it saved us over here. You know, is there some way that we can match that? I'd, I'd like to have that come back in a, you know, a year after or whatever is, is appropriate, um, that we could have some kind of a measurement in that regard. Mr. Chairman, may I respond to that uh, inquiry? Sure, certainly. Thank you. So um, counties are working with the state um, utilizing UCLA to do an evaluation outcome study for this drug medical program. So we certainly will work with them to provide input so they can look into comparison before and after in terms of impact on society, on uh, cost, and on utilization and quality of care for the individual in this program. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Others? Uh, I will also want to thank you uh, for the work that went into putting this together. I know that you'll be going to the Santa Cruz City Council in January to talk about our services on mental health and addiction services, and I hope you will uh, provide them information about this program and also explain to them the risk that the county is taking in ensuring that this, um, these services are available to people who need it here in our community. I think it, it's, uh, it's we, we don't, the, the public doesn't understand the, all the different ways in which the county is working <laughs> to address critical health problems like mental health services and addiction services. So I think it's, it provides a good opportunity to, to explain, and this is a great program. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, it is now 1040, we have a 1045 item. Um, I'm gonna suggest that we take a brief five minute break uh, and we will start exactly at 1045 uh, to do the Green Business uh, Awards and then we'll, uh, then we'll come back for the, uh, for the uh, other program.
item, which is item number 61, presentation of green business certification awards to exemplary new Santa Cruz County green businesses as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Public Works. Uh, there are a list of the green business award recipients. Um, and I'd like to introduce Marisol Goulet, Department of Public Works Pre-Treatment Program Specialist is here to present the item. Good morning, Marisol. Good morning. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Yes, you right. did. <laughs> On behalf of the Public Works Department, we would like to present to the board the businesses in the county <clears throat> that have met the criteria to become a certified green business. The county's green business certification program is an incentive-based program designed to encourage businesses to meet and exceed environmental standards while conserving natural resources. The businesses receiving the award today have voluntarily reduced water consumption, retrofitted lights, and made other electrical modifications to reduce energy consumption. They've also reduced solid waste through recycling and smarter purchasing, and have gone above and beyond regulatory requirements by implementing pollution prevention practices in their businesses. The county's certification process involves a series of rigorous audits by environmental and conservation experts to come up with the best available technology to prevent pollution <clears throat> and conserve natural resources. These businesses are the industry front runners that meet and exceed exceptional environmental standards. They have invested significant time, effort, and financial resources to ensure that they meet the criteria for certification. The California Green Business Network has been operating as a nonprofit for the past two years and was recently notified that the organization would receive a one time appropriation of $1 million from the state to, <clears throat> to start several new programs as well as fund existing programs. It's expected that once the funds are received, existing programs like the County of Santa Cruz will receive $20,000 each in funding. Additionally, PG&E has once again renewed its support by offering funding and training for another year. As we gather to congratulate these newly certified businesses, we would also like to thank the board for your support to keep this program successful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the name and of the businesses that have qualified for this year's Green Business Award will now be read so that representatives of these businesses can stand together as a group to be recognized for their effort. We'd like you to please remain standing until we have read the names of all the businesses and the members and members of the audience. Please hold your applause until the end of the reading. I'm going to get to start with the businesses in the first district, um, which I'll announce. The first, business, first district businesses receiving certification include the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office, Tracy Herfindahl, um, Home Space, uh, Denise and Michael Beachy, uh, Salon Santa Cruz, Karen Horton, and the Soquel Creek Water District, Vi Campbell. And in the second district, we have Ad Manor with Sandy Manor, ABC Daycare with Hilda Fernandez, Airport Automotive with Ryan Hart, Coast Rehab with Jerry Van Dyke, Capitola Soquel Chamber of Commerce with Tony Castro, Capitola Self Storage with Joshua Nathan, Ocean Champions with Chris Laughlin, and Sotola Bar and Grill with Ashley Bernardi. And in the third district, I'd like to recognize Santa Cruz Waldorf School and Pacific Elementary School and Carrie Napolis. Fourth District, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Goodwood Products uh, from Summit Views and Jennifer Young, Fruteria Quitzel, and Maria Pena. Did I pronounce that one uh, name correctly uh, for fruit, uh, Fruteria? Quitzel. Huh? Quitzel. Quitzel. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. In the 5th District, I'd like to recognize Benedict DDS and Associates. Thank you. Will, you. will you please join me in giving a round of applause to these businesses? <laughs> On behalf of the County of Santa Cruz, I want to thank each business recognized today for their continued support of the county's green business program. We invite the business representatives to gather in the hallway where public works staff has arranged a reception 
we're not going to be joining you. I see Supervisor Cap had already found the food, but we're going to continue on with oh. our with our. Uh, no, no, he found a, he found food somewhere else. It sounds I like. I did. All right. uh, Terry Dorsey made uh, chocolate chip cookies. Okay. For all right. <laughs> well, we won't be joining you today for the reception, but I just want to uh, acknowledge the hard work it takes to get the green business certification and the importance that plays in our community. You stand as true leaders in the communities. Thank you very much. So we'll go back to our regularly scheduled agenda, which is item number 58, which is consider recommendations for redesign of the SIP and PAC programs submitted by the Health Services Agency on behalf of the PAC Executive Committee and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Health Services Agency Director. Sorry to have you come and go. Chairmen and members of the board, I'm Jane Nguyen from the Health Services Agency. Thank you very much for taking the time to consider the items in front of your board regarding the recommendation for PAC program redesign. I want to thank um, our PAC executive team members um, and all the stakeholders who've been involved um, in the evaluation, uh, looking at the evaluation findings of, uh, from CSUMB and also working on um, options for the program redesign. Eric Guerrero is with me this morning and um, he has been instrumental in um, looking at the redesign and how the, uh, in the system of care uh, framework and working with stakeholders um, in order to move forward for, uh, to the recommendation uh, in front of your board today. So with that, I would like to uh, hand it over to uh, Mr. Rera for the presentation. Good morning. Thank you, and thank you, board, for allowing us the opportunity to review these recommendations with you today. I want to express a special thank you to the work groups that developed these recommendations, the clinical work group, the housing work group, which was facilitated by Rainey Marr, and the criminal justice work group, which was facilitated by Judge Deneen Guy and District Attorney Roselle. As you recall from prior meetings, the PACT program in its current form was evaluated by CSUMB. CSUMB came up with a set of recommendations, eight recommendations for how to improve the PACT program. And I wanted to spend a few minutes walking through those recommendations as they give some context to the overall redesign process that we considered. The first was looking at alternative sources of funding for the program and opportunities to leverage additional funding, such as the item listed in number two, um, specifically around drug Medi-Cal funds to support the provision of services to packed recipients. Third recommendation was around looking at alternative sentencing models, which is something that the criminal justice group looked at clarifying the program terms and conditions for who graduates from the program or who gets dismissed from the program, which was recommendations four and five. How we can enhance case management information systems with clear indications of progress and establish periodic assessments. Um, one of the areas that they specifically recommended was looking at the use of an electronic health record to record assessments and <coughs> progress notes in. <coughs> Number seven, looking at alternative types of treatment such as harm reduction approaches and pre-adjudication options. And all of these recommendations were considered by the three work groups within a larger framework um, of assumptions that we use to develop the recommendations that you hear about this morning. One of the initial observations by each of the groups was that the participants in the prior PACT program were homeless. And all of the individuals were homeless. Um, many of whom were chronically homeless in the community, and that presented a number of challenges to effectively working with them and providing services to them. 
the current approach to working with individuals who are homeless, court involved, and not court involved is not necessarily an integrated approach, and it often supports a model based on siloed care. Um, we have a number of different homeless programs in our community that are each touching this population, and often which door you enter into services dictates the types of services you're able to access as a homeless individual. A broader approach to working with a homeless population could increase access to a larger array of services in the community and serve more people. The fourth assumption that we worked on in terms of developing these recommendations was that the planned drug medical expansion that we heard about earlier today provides access to not only more services, but access to new services not previously reimbursable under Medi-Cal, such as case management. The fifth assumption that we worked under was that we felt very strongly about the importance of maintaining the presence of our specialty courts and court processes to support the unique needs of individuals served by the court and the resources that those court programs offer. And hence, you'll hear a recommendation for the creation of a new packed court. The sixth assumption was looking at how we could redeploy existing staff to the courts to create an efficient, effective service delivery system and provide that oversight for management of services in the community. So the importance of maintaining a linkage to the court programs to what this redesigned model would be would ensure that we have effective outcomes for the people who are ultimately served by the new program. So what came out of the redesign recommendations are several key principles. First being how we can improve collaboration among service providers through the creation of a new multidisciplinary team, which will meet two to three times weekly, so very frequently, to coordinate the different services and referrals from the community, local businesses, the courts, and law enforcement. <coughs> Number two is maintaining a focus on the homeless population. So looking at a broader system of care for the homeless population with a special emphasis on individuals who live in hotspot areas throughout the county, for example, in downtown Santa Cruz. And number three is maintaining and formalizing the Bob Lee Pact Court as a specialty court program similar to what we have with the Behavioral Health Court. Number four is supporting a broader, more efficient focus on working with the homeless and designing a system that links homeless individuals with the right services at the right time, including court-involved individuals who have had repeated contacts with law enforcement in the community. In terms of the proposed model, we're proposing a new collection of, of service providers that fall under one umbrella that we're currently calling Santa Cruz Hopes. Santa Cruz Homeless Outreach Proactive Engagement and Services Team. This HOPES team brings the various homeless providing agencies such as the Downtown Outreach Program, the Downtown Streets Program, the Homeless Services Center, our different county programs, the Homeless Persons Health Project under one umbrella to ensure that we have coordinated services and response to the homeless population who are referred for services. And there are three phases that I wanted to talk about this morning in terms of how we approach these referrals to the HOPES team. The first step is an initial triage, and that's probably one of the more important pieces to the model in terms of de determining through an initial assessment what our immediate response is gonna be. Is this a situation that requires an immediate visible response in the community? or can it be referred back to the team for a response and a more coordinated effort amongst the different team members. In the second step, we're doing an outreach, engagement, and assessment, continued assessment process through the team who receives a referral for a homeless individual, and we're determining the level of their mental health needs, substance abuse needs, and whether or not they're involved with the court. There's an outreach and engagement process for individuals to determine their treatment readiness based on an evidence-based 
uh, motivational interviewing process, as well as introducing a harm reduction process for individuals who may not be ready for treatment, but nevertheless we want to remain engaged and connected with them in the community, particularly for those difficult to engage individuals. In step three, we see a referral based on four different tracks that are again based on the level of severity of their mental illness, substance use disorder, and whether or not the individual has an involvement with the court. For individuals who have a mild or moderate mental health issue, uh, mild to severe substance use disorder, and court involvement, those individuals will be directed to the Bob Lee Pact Court. And at that point, there's further assessment by the Pact Court and the District Attorney's Office to determine whether that individual is appropriate for services through the Pact Court or whether they might be referred to another more appropriate service venue. For individuals with a severe mental illness, mild or severe substance use disorder, and court involvement, they will be directed towards the behavioral health court track. For individuals with a mild to moderate mental health issue, mild to severe substance use disorder, not currently involved with the court, they will be connected with our homeless person's health project and our integrated behavioral health program for treatment services. And finally, for those individuals who are again not court involved, but have a severe mental illness, and any degree of substance use disorder, they'll be connected with County Mental Health Services and our partner community organizations for, for continued provision of services. So what we're trying to accomplish is folding the prior PACT program into a broader system of care, leveraging additional resources for this population, increasing the numbers of clients served, and establishing a new PACT specialty court. We continue to have a focus on priority cases, particularly those who did not fit into the existing PACT model that we have today. We're currently working on um, developing specific outcome measures for the new program, um, and we have outcomes defined for each of five different domain areas system outcomes, health outcomes, community outcomes, criminal justice outcomes, and individual outcomes. And we're looking to finalize those different outcome measures and make a recommendation back to the executive committee on which ones to proceed with. Right now we have about 28 different outcome measures and we're still working on determining which ones we can effectively measure um, and report on in the future. Our next steps um, include going back to the City Council after today's meeting and providing a similar presentation to the Council on these recommendations, finalizing our outcomes and reporting domains, um, beginning to launch our multidisciplinary team meetings beginning in late January, early February, and recruiting for new positions that are called for in the new model. Um, beginning later this month and during the month of January if we, we do proceed with, with these recommendations. And that concludes my presentation this morning and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for the presentation. I'll see if board members have questions. Supervisor Coonerty, no? Um, I had just, yep. uh, oh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you. I, um, congratulations again in the follow-up to the uh, the item that we just discussed. Um, this is um, really a, a very good example of how a government establishing a program, seeing how it's worked, and staying on top of it. And I think there's been some tremendous successes with the PAC, progr PAC program that began as the um, Bob Lee Downtown Accountability Program in 2013. Um, but I think the collaboration between law enforcement, uh, the public service agency, the healthcare workers, and the courts is really uh, a very, um, something to be recognized and it's a very positive move. Um, I think that having this in place, but then seeing some of the uh, shortcomings of it, but seeing how to address those in the best way we can, and doing it pretty quickly too. I mean, we had to have some years to look at how well it worked and it's worked very well in a lot of instances. 
but I think we can, we are going to be doing a better job. And I really want to thank the people who have gotten, uh, who have collaborated to get this uh, a new, new vision of how we can address this problem because it's one that people talk about every day in our community. And uh, it's something that um, I'm really glad to see that we're going to update it and I think we're gonna have more positive results because of it. Thank you. Um, I just had two quick questions. Uh, when you talked about the outcomes, and you said you hadn't uh, completely worked them all out, um, do the individual outcomes include the housing piece or the shelter piece? Yes, they do. Great. Um, the other question I wanted to ask is uh, that we recently read in the paper uh, that, the, that there were some city council members who were questioning whether they were gonna um, uh, fund this program. If we don't have the participation of the uh, the city of Santa Cruz, what would what would happen? What would we do with this program? Yes, thank you for asking that question. Um, at this time, the budget is built upon uh, very active participation uh, financially with the city of Santa Cruz. If um, the city of Santa Cruz city council decided to not fund this program. Um, our staff would need to return to your board with um, recommendation. We would have to review and evaluate the impact. And we're, uh, frankly speaking, if we don't have funding from the city, it's really difficult for me as agency director um, to um, request your board uh, to implement this program without um, the support from the city as well. So, um, but we need to work with our team, come back and work with the PAC executive team, work with stakeholders, and bring back the recommendation to your board, but it will be very difficult without the funding support from the city to uh, implement this program. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'll open it up to see if members of the public have any comments. Good morning, nice to see our district attorney, Mr. Nice Rosell. to see you, thank you. I, I didn't have much to say, I just wanted to say that uh, we appreciate the board's support, that this program was started as Supervisor mm -hmm. McPherson uh, just alluded to by Bob Lee, and I was the person that was assigned to this program when it started. Um, and I just wanna say that through, the vision there was a cooperative vision. Uh, it was a vision that encompassed law enforcement, mental health, uh, treatment providers, the court, uh, the public defender, and probation. And that vision uh, kind of continues. And so what we have today is a cooperative effort once again. And the, the court portion is one portion. Uh, this addresses a much larger and broader sort of population in a comprehensive way. So I just want to say that it does continue the original vision. I'm pleased as the district attorney of this county uh, to see that. And we have had tremendous positive sort of results out of it. And I think that what we're going to have here is a way to serve sort of a larger population. Some of those court involved and uh, some of those not court involved. So I want to thank your support uh, and I want to thank all the hard work that's gone into this. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning, Judge Guy. Good morning, thank you. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the work of all the people that came together to really look at what was a collaboration outside of a bigger uh, system of care and to look at that to figure out how we could more effectively um, give uh, services to the individuals that are going in and out of our courts. Um, the PAC program has been in place for three and a half years, and it has been a, a collaboration between all different uh, court partners and through the county, and we have um, expanded that uh, program to the point where I think we've served uh, between SIP and PAC approximately 300 people. These are the folks that are going in and out of our court and justice systems, uh, repeatedly costing the taxpayers and the county um, a lot of extra uh, money and services and time. Uh, so we have been really working to try to address that issue uh, through the uh, one of the breakout uh, groups that was mentioned, one of the uh, uh, groups that really were tasked to assess where, where we go from here, what do we do. I will report that a 16-page report was put together from our justice system uh, group putting together uh, recommendations f addressing uh, four of the eight recommendations from the CSUMB. Um, 
uh, uh, research. So the uh, issues regarding uh, graduation, the criteria, acceptability, uh, different types of phasing, uh, all those issues are addressed and uh, in a uh, redesign recommendation that was put forward from our justice system group. Also the court has expanded as well. We have added a collaborative court a coordinator, Nicolette Lee, is now working to work with the county agencies and all of you to uh, address better communication between uh, our behavior health court, our PAC court, as well as our veterans court, and our uh, parole reentry court. So we now have four uh, what we call uh, collaborative courts. So I know the, the word that's being used is specialty courts, but it's collaborative courts because it really is a collaboration of everybody across all of our systems to work together uh, with our folks that are in these four courts. So I will be uh, stepping down from the PAC court. Uh, Judge Basket will continue the work. She was already part of this uh, group and these uh, protocol and outline recommendations, uh, but I will be stepping in the shoes of Judge Moore. So I'll be working with you all in the Behavior Health Court and still one of the collaborative courts in the county. So thank you for all of your consideration and uh, we're very pleased with uh, the um, communication and the uh, idea that we're going to be working together collaboratively and putting together a system of communication as well as service. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Is there anyone else who would like to address us? Uh, seeing none, I'll bring it back to our board for action. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I appreciate the work that's gone on to this over the last few years. I do think it's important to reflect a little bit on the history of this program and uh, some of the concerns I have of the actions that the City Council took recently in regards to continuing this program. Uh, this program was created, it came out of a, uh, in essence, a city task force along with Bob Lee at the time to disproportionately benefit the city at that time, I mean, issues that were occurring uh, downtown. I, I would argue that the program still disproportionately benefits the city, benefits uh, the police department, benefits downtown businesses. I agree with Judge Guy that it has ancillary benefits throughout the entire county, but the reality is, is that this is also a significant ask of the county from both the staffing and financial uh, ask on, on a program that really disproportionately benefits uh, the city. I, I'll say that I was disappointed by the rhetoric that came from the majority of the city council at their last meeting. Uh, for a program that in essence they asked for, uh, a program that they've had a seat at the table the entire time for, uh, and a redesign that they also asked for. This was, uh, it's very reasonable to review a program, uh, to do programmatic review, we do it on everything else we do through our departments, uh, and to see how we can make it better, and I think exactly what you've created is a much better program than actually what we had before. I think that uh, moving forward with this is the right thing to do, but I can't, we can't, as a county, uh, just simply fund programs that have a disproportionate benefit to another entity when the other entity is a partner only part of the time. Um, I, I believe that, that what we should do is we should move these recommended actions, but we should make the actions contingent upon full participation from the city. And if the city elects to not do their funding, uh, I would like to direct that you come back at the first possible meeting after that city decision for the, this board to consider whether or not we want to continue with the program. I think that the, either the city is a partner or, or they're not. If they don't want to be a partner, then let them let the city council make that statement at their next meeting. So with that a motion the, to move the recommended actions uh, with the addition of, uh, of uh, requirement that the city participate in funding and if not, bring back to us. And I'll second that and um, I appreciate well, first, let me start by appreciating the, the, the importance of this program, specifically Judge Guy, District Attorney Roselle, um, and then the HSA team, who's been a really, um, have been fantastic in bringing people together. This population was a population that essentially nobody wanted to serve because they're so challenging, uh, and with a bunch of agencies that hadn't worked together traditionally to really collaborate and find, um, um, collaborative solutions and because of leadership and because of a commitment to doing right by the community, we have a really, I think we have a good program that, that's being made even better uh, by the work that's being done. I expect that the city, uh, the city should participate uh, and um, in my conversations with council members, um, I would expect a unanimous vote when it comes before them uh, because they should, they, they, they should see the benefit of, uh, of this, of this program that, that is, uh, that is really being called for uh, by members of the 
the, of the entire community, but specifically in Santa Cruz as, as vitally important to the public safety of, of the city uh, and the county. And so, um, so I'm hopeful that they'll come back and, and uh, continue to be the partners that they have been, um, and I support this recommendation. So there's a motion by uh, friends, seconded by Coonerty. Supervisor yeah, McPherson. Yeah, I just wanted to um, mention that uh, from the outset, I, I worked very closely with Father Neil Coonerty about this and putting this in place, who was just adamant to get this done, as was stated with the uh, urgence of the city of Santa Cruz. So I, I do appreciate you know, what we have done in the program that we've had but to take a look at it so quickly and say this is how we can even make it better, and I'm convinced that we can if we get the funding for it with the city and the county, uh, we're gonna have a bigger and better program to serve a lot of people who need it most. Um, uh, Supervisor Caput. We could uh, <laughs> clarify exactly what the motion is. I actually am prepared to vote on the whole proposal right now, but it seems like it would be delayed. No, it's, it's to move the recommended actions. Okay. To just simply make them contingent upon the city funding, which by the way, the program's contingent upon anyway. <laughs> so if the city funds it, then uh, this moves forward. If the city doesn't fund it, then the additional direction is to have our health staff come back at the first possible meeting after that to talk to us about okay. what to do at that point. Thank you. Is it clear to the clerk of the board? Then I will call the question. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for all the support and help um, uh, from all of our partners in this process. Thank you. Uh, next, we will move on to item number 59, which is a public hearing to consider amendments to the Santa Cruz County Code, Chapter 17.10 regarding affordable housing ordinance, certification of CEQA exemption, and related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the director of the planning department. There are a number of attachments. The ordinance, chapter 17.10, the clean copy. The ordinance, chapter 17.10, the strikeout and underline copy. The CEQA notice of exemption, and the summary of job housing linkage fee. Good morning. Good morning. Julie Conway, I manage the county's housing program. We are returning today to follow up on a report on the county's affordable housing program that your board heard on October 24th. That included recommendations for uh, which you provided guidance and approval in concept and directed staff to return with a draft ordinance language for further consideration. As a reminder to listeners, the county's affordable housing program began after passage of Measure J in 1978, which required the county to adopt policies to ensure that 15% of residential development is affordable to average income households. The county has maintained an active housing program since that time, returning regularly for a review of the program and adopting policies that seek to address the county's changing housing need. In 2015, the county retained the services of Kaiser Marston Associates to conduct a nexus study and feasibility analysis uh, that resulted in an updated affordable housing program, um, establishing an affordable housing impact fee, or AHIF, which is a local source of housing funds. Besides the impact fee approach, the board also decided that for a two-year period, uh, developers would have the option of meeting their affordable housing obligation uh, by providing an affordable unit or paying AHIF with direction to staff to return in two years with a follow-up report, which we did in October. In preparation for the two-year review, Kaiser Marston was again retained to analyze d the development economics of the housing program to ensure that we're not uh, constructing an obstacle to development. Let's see. On October 24th, the board supervisors uh, received the scheduled update of the housing program and provided direction, um, as I said, to return with proposed amendments. Um, and we also included a request for further analysis of the affordable housing impact fee for non-residential development and a return to the Housing Advisory Commission, or the HAC, for a second time to further discuss on-site inclusionary requirements for rental housing. In today's draft ordinance are provisions for the um, updated affordable housing impact fees for residential ownership projects and commercial projects. Uh, 
re requiring on-site units at 15% for ownership projects of seven or more units. Um, excuse me. <coughs> Um, including MAP subdivisions being used as rental housing, and uh, to incentivize rental housing by encouraging the use of the density bonus program and charging a fee rather than requiring on-site units. Staff is recommending that one of the recommendations from October be revised, which I'll discuss later in today's report. One of the key features in today's proposed ordinance is a change to the fees for residential ownership projects. This chart reflects the HIF the board discussed in October. Um, the fees continue to incentivize construction of smaller homes with a graduated fee scale um, and includes additions, remodels, and replacements at the same rate, but only for net new square footage over 500 square feet. ADUs will be charged HIF as an addition and will also exempt the first 500 square feet. So the rate of HIF for ADUs um, of $2 per square foot has not changed, um, but the first 500 square feet will be exempt, exempted, and that's consistent with the overall approach to ADUs that your board discussed last week. Um, AHIF will be waived for any ADU that enters into a deed restriction for affordability. Uh, the unified fee schedule, which will be considered by the board later today, reflects these changes. The AHIF for commercial development uh, reflect the October direction of an increase to $3 per square foot for commercial uses other than certain agricultural buildings. As requested, staff reviewed commercial development permit history to determine whether the AHIF would create a barrier to mom and pop commercial developments. Of the of 182 permits, only nine included net new square footage. Um, over half were under 3,000 square feet. The majority of the permits are for tenant improvements that are not subject to HIF. Staff is recommending that HIF continue to apply um, to new commercial square footage. The board's October direction included a request um, for a further discussion of the affordable housing requirements for rental projects. On November 1st, the Housing Advisory Commission discussed rental housing policies, acknowledging the need for rental housing and the fact that the market is not uh, producing uh, rental, market-driven rental at this time. The HAC recognized that the inclusionary housing requirement is not a primary barrier to building rental apartments, but that low density and other development standards are likely the greater hurdle. Um, the density bonus provisions of county code section 1712 allow for up to 35% additional density along with concessions on development standards. Um, it's been the county's policy uh, for some time to uh, allow HUD fair market rent um, and the density bonus program provides an opportunity to get some restricted units um, and also address a badly needed uh, community housing need. So as I mentioned, in 2012, uh, your board adopted the policy of allowing owners of county affordable rental units to charge HUD FMR rather than the Measure J restricted rent. So I've um, illustrated up here the difference. Um, and we are finding that since we put this policy in, pro in place, um, more and more owners of rental units um, are, are choosing to rent to voucher holders. We are also finding that bu um, builders who are interested in market rental projects um, using a density bonus are, are very interested in this because it helps level it out and make it easier to actually build. Um, so it's worth um, acknowledging that, that we have that policy in place. So the Housing Advisory Commission recognized that the market is not producing rental housing at this time and recommended the continuation of the current policy of charging the nominal $2 per square foot. The HAC also requested regular reports on rental projects that are submitted for approval with the intention of revisiting this program in the future um, should the market and our density standards start to be producing um, in market rate rental projects. 
The 15% inclusionary requirement um, results in an on-site affordable unit with a seven unit project. This was recommended in the October report. Um, we also recommended that um, the developers no longer have the choice, the on-site unit be required, um, and the board would, would retain its ability to um, let a project pay the fee when that makes sense. So developers and property owners um, need the county to maintain consistent policies when it comes to inclusionary housing. Um, those uh, elements become built into expectations for price. Um, and the two-year uh, experiment in developer's choice has not increased the rate of development. Um, and unlike rental housing, um, it, does, it has not prevented subdivision projects from proceeding. We continue to see them um, come in at all stages and it hasn't slowed them down or increased them by changing this. So upon reviewing the development economics, staff believes that requiring on-site affordable units for projects of seven or more represents an overall balanced approach to encourage construction of homes and provide permanent affordability um, in 15% of them for this difficult market. In October, staff recommended that a change be made to the program to require HIF when building permits are issued. This was recommended because the current system of payment when homes are sold was resulting in home, home buyers f um, facing an unexpected fee and it wasn't part of their financing. Um, so since the October recommendation, we've met with a number of parties who said that payment when the permit is final um, would actually facilitate development rather than when it is issued. Um, so it'll relieve carrying charges during the construction period. Um, so by doing that, the fee would be uh, included in the cost of development, um, and it, but it would address the issue of an unexpected fee for the homeowner. So we're actually recommending that this provision be incorporated into the ordinance, which is a change from what we discussed earlier after discussing it. So it is recommended today um, that your board hold a public hearing uh, to consider revisions to the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1710, determine the proposed project is exempt from CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, approve the ordinance amending the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1710 in concept, and direct, direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance for second reading and final approval on the next available agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? I just had two. Um, one was uh, on the last change you suggested about the fees uh, when the final building permit, um, yeah. that's also the certificate of occupancy would be at the same time or? We order it. We, yeah. What we do is we final the building permit rather than issue a CEVO. So but at the same time, it's the same term. It's the same. It's the same term. I just wanted to be, get clarity. Second is uh, since our meeting has the Housing Advisory Commission look over. Yes. These um, yes, they met on November first, um, as described in the report, and discussed this item um, again. And they had also discussed it at their September meeting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Conway, for your work as always. Uh, I do. I have some. Questions, but I guess maybe really where I'm at is I'm I'm just not um, sure what the best process is here moving forward. I mean, this is a very uh, I think that we can all agree we want to build more housing, um, the more the right type of housing, I should say, uh, and we also want to build more affordable housing. And so we need more housing, even at the market rate, the more affordable market rate, and as well as just uh, deed restricted affordable, and. Uh, We've had a lot of conversations about this. I don't, I don't want to take an action that in any way, shape, or form would reduce any of those things from happening. Um, and I've had planning over the last few years has come before the board to talk about the difficulty of building, but also given timelines of how long it takes from a land acqu acquisition standpoint, a financing standpoint, a permitting standpoint, an actual construction standpoint. One of the things I'm concerned about is I'm not totally convinced that two, a two-year review is really uh, long enough uh, on this change. We, we spent a, a year 
and a pretty significant discussion. Obviously, there were court cases that impacted the need for that discussion, but uh, that led to the significant revision in 2015. Uh, but if you were uh, a developer, uh, the change between then and now uh, to go through all those steps, I think, is a very quick uh, decision to say that maybe it didn't quite work. Um, do you feel that the two-year review has given enough data to the planning department to really move down a road? I guess it's not really a different road. It's going back to the road in many respects that we used to be down. Uh, and that you have enough data from the few projects that were cited in the October report to really say that this is a necessary change at this point? So, um, as, as you know, we were directed to return in, in two years. Uh, um, so that's what we did. And um, what we also did is we wanted to make sure that we updated and reviewed the development economics because, um, as you know, we agree that we do not want to um, present an obstacle to development. Um, so we reviewed that um, with our economist. We do believe um, that these are, that the 15% on site at seven units um, is, is reasonable in a balanced approach. Um, we had that reviewed specifically for feasibility because we didn't want it to be an obstacle. The other thing we looked at is, and, it, and it's difficult, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a policy call, um, right? But, um, you know, we have not seen uh, projects speed up and we haven't seen it slow down. Um, we've had an inclusionary ordinance for 40 years. Um, it is a known um, commodity. I do think that it, that um, consistency is important because you're right, it does happen over a long horizon. Um, negotiations for land are happening over a long horizon, which is why um, you know the, the decision, I think consistency is important. So that, those were factors we took into approach um, when we were when we were talking about this. Uh, Kathy Malloy, Privilege Planning Director. I mean, to your point, though, I think it is uh, fair to say that pre-development, you know, someone identifying that they, uh, a piece of land that they want to put together a project, um, get, putting their team together and going through that, two years is a short time um, to come up with a project, get it submitted um, to the county. And so just wanted to confirm that that I appreciate that's a fair point. So I appreciate that. So Ms. Conway, I guess my point is is that we had consistency for 40 years and then we mm -hmm. broke that consistency and now we're trying to go back right. to another thing. So if mm -hmm. we were arguing consistency, we would probably maintain what we're doing for a longer period of time to see whether it changes the trajectory from what we had had mm -hmm. for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not, a, it's not a value statement of the efficacy of, of Measure J per se, it's just that we have had uh, I, I consider the affordable housing component over here and there's a whole suite of other things that the board's looking to change in order to make development mm -hmm. uh, easier through the code mod and the sustainable Santa Cruz component over here, but I also view them as part and parcel. If you have a developer that says maybe item four or five of concern is the inclusionary requirement, it's not number one, which is consistency or uh, costs or in essence that insecurity of knowing whether or not the project will even go through. Uh, so we obviously have to modify to the degree we can the codes that allow for the densities, allow for the corridor locations to happen. But if this is still one of the 20% of the decision making process, and it's, I don't want to make that decision in a vacuum. I feel like what we're doing is, is pulling it out and making it in a vacuum. And, and I, I remember the discussion, we had a, a robust discussion actually at that time two years ago as to whether we should uh, change it. And we had a, a difference of, I mean, respectful difference of opinions at that time. Uh, my colleague had re recommended a one year review and you know, I made the motion for a two year review, uh, but I didn't anticipate a wholesale change back at two years. I just, I just considered this in essence a check-in. And this is more than a check-in recommendation. It's a, it's a full scale change. So, I'm, this is one of the few times that I, I'm really not convinced yet uh, um, what's being presented to me is the right direction. I don't feel comfortable uh, necessarily with the direction. There are certain things in here that I'm not as concerned about. I think some of the fee asks aren't, aren't um, uh, the end of the world. It really just comes down to the inclusionary component and whether or not that's going to, uh, if it's a word, I don't know, disincentivize. I mean, incentivize became a word since we've been adults, I guess, but uh, to, to discourage development. Uh, is something we just don't want. And I recognize that, that, that this, is a, this is a difficult conversation for people in Santa Cruz County to have. I and mean, people don't like the term growth, they don't like, but I mean, realistically, what we're talking about is a new kind of development to both meet the needs that we haven't met for the last 40 years uh, and to meet the future needs. We're, these aren't single family homes in suburban areas, that's part of the code mod. 
but I just don't know whether the inclusionary is there, and that's where uh, I'm torn on this. So I appreciate you answering those two questions, but I, I think that these should be more of a holistic discussion than we're having right now, which is my hesitancy on voting just on this element. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Not, uh, let's open it up for public discussion then. Please come forward. Crowded room this, this morning. Uh, Casey Beyer from the Santa, Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, Chairman Leopold and, and uh, supervisors, thank you for uh, meeting with us over the last couple of weeks as your staff uh, uh, brought this forward in October and now again for a hearing today. And I want to uh, compliment your staff for also meeting with us and giving us their insight of how they got, how they arrived at their position today. Uh, we just respectfully disagree on a couple of items and we, we believe, uh, as a Supervisor Friend has said, that two years, simply put, is not, is not a lengthy enough time to make an evaluation whether a program is working or not. Ask any developer in Santa Cruz County how long it takes to get a construction permit. Just ask that question and it's not two years. It's more like seven years, and in some cases, more like 15 years, depending on the location. What we are rec recommending is that you continue this item and bring it into a more holistic conversation with the community and the stakeholders. We're not against inclusionary zoning. We just think if it's gotta be done right, and it's gotta be done where there's land use opportunities where that type of development can be placed. I call it right size, right location. Uh, you're going through a, a, a zone modification program, but that's a year and a half away. Now you wanna put this particular item in front of it and then ask the developer to say, okay, build those seven units, and, and by the way, make, make one or, or two of those units inclusionary. And he's gonna, he or she's gonna ask you the question, where's the land? Where's the available land to do that? Where's the, the, the land owner that's willing to sell at a market rate so that you can build those units? All of those questions are unanswered in this report. Uh, I respectfully appreciate uh, uh, Julie and Kathy's work on this and for meeting with this, and I just respect uh, having an opportunity to talk to the CAO. But please, take a look at where you're going. I think there's better judgment ahead. Thank you. Thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Leopold, board. Um, I just wanna echo more of what Supervisor Friend said in terms of taking some time and having a more holistic approach to to uh, this kind of policy spectrum of, of dealing with housing affordability generally. Um, I won't take up too much of your time. We sent you a letter, we've sat down and met with most of you um, as well as staff and the CAO. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit of time in terms of, we would love for you to, in, to continue this to a later date so when we can have a more holistic assessment of the impact these policies may have, but to tell you what we're gonna do in that time, um, in that time, we would compile pro formers, we will compile, st compile statistics that would give you a local context around how these policies are being implemented currently. We'd provide you with case study analysis of looking at other areas that have addressed this, addressed this issues and uh, drafted their own inclusionary ordinances. I would definitely point towards the city of Santa Cruz, which has brought in multiple consultants just on inclusionary ordinances and just on the kind of nuances and different kinds of balancing approaches you can take, whether it's incentive structures or whether it's tiering different fee structures. But we're happy to provide this education to host some of these meetings um, and to just provide more local context around the impact that the, these policies might be having. So we would encourage you to, to continue this ordinance to a later date, at which time we'll use that time to provide more information, more context, and ultimately help you to inform you and make a better decision. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. Um, and today I'm here to speak for the approximately 13,000 people who are on the uh, Housing Authority wait list for affordable housing, of which uh, several thousand are Section 8 uh, applicants. And for the 460 seniors who uh, did not get spaces in the St. Stephen's project. So that's the, our name, Affordable Housing Now, not several years from now, now. All those people need it now, not later. Um, I would like to point out that for years and years and years, 
uh, as Ms. Conway pointed out, all across the state of California, there have been 15% inclusionary requirements, and builders have built everywhere, including our own area, with a 15% inclusionary requirement. The only thing that has changed is that now they want to wait and not have an inclusionary requirement. When they get through with their study, they'll say, we can't have it. It's a disincentive. Well, they made the same arguments before, and they still built. In this environment, with the most expensive housing sales and the most expensive rents, that's a preposterous argument. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Um, anyway, uh, we also have a disagreement with the HAC on the rental requirement, uh, on the inclusionary part of the rentals. Um, if you do the math, it still doesn't make sense, okay? If you build, say, a 40-unit project with 1,000 square feet in each unit, that would give you, with a 15% requirement, six affordable housing rentals. If you pay $2 per square foot, that's $80,000. That doesn't even buy half of a unit. You, the average, I think, is around 130,000. So it makes no sense at all. Um, if I could just make one more final statement. You have a minute left. Okay. Um, so as was brought out, there is, this, uh, there is this substitute of doing Section 8. And it would seem to me that a developer would like that because they lose no money at all. They get the same rent uh, that they would otherwise. However, if you're building 12, 1,500 square foot units, um, it doesn't make sense. So uh, with smaller units, it would be better. Otherwise, what we end up with are units that are affordable only to the most uh, prosperous people. So please take action, don't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Kent Washburn, former chairman of your Housing Advisory Commission. I understand two of my colleagues were here this morning when I had a court hearing and uh, couldn't be with you. Um, I think the item before you represents good staff work. I support it and, uh, and its recommendations, not because I think it's a final step or a solution. But, uh, I, I think I'm just looking at the same elephant from a different side as uh, Zach and some of the rest of you are, seeing it as only a partial, uh, you know, one step and, and uh, a long journey that needs to be taken uh, concerning the needs of, uh, of our community for low and moderate uh, affordable housing. We're not getting the job done. That's the, um, and and we, we file farther and farther behind uh, every year. We rank in the least affordable housing market uh, statistics every year nationwide, not just in California, in terms of the difference between our uh, our uh, median income and our median real estate prices. Uh, I think uh, to some extent today's uh, directive, which uh, staff, uh, uh, or today's proposal, which uh, fulfills a directive made two years ago, reflects the time two years ago when we didn't see as much of an emergency. Today, from the, uh, from the standpoint of, uh, of the uh, widening gap, I think it represents uh, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic after it has hit the iceberg. The iceberg meaning the uh, tremendous need for affordable housing. Your staff didn't have a directive to, uh, to steer around the iceberg or the power to steer around it. All they had, all they had was a directive to, uh, to take care of deck chairs. And it's a good idea to keep them out of the way when, uh, when people are headed to the lifeboats. But uh, we have people in our community, the elderly and retired, people with health problems, people uh, who, uh, who can't uh, get uh, good work um, with, with needs that are not being met. I have four recommendations for you. First of all, turn the hack loose, the Housing Advisory Commission. Its uh, mandate says uh, to conduct a continuous study of housing issues and report to the Board of Supervisors on its work. And I think you should, uh, should uh, give us more work. Um, your staff will tell you that it needs more staff time. So give them a little more funding, please. Uh, Julie Conway, since I met her about four years ago, always is trying to get more than 24 hours a day to, uh, to take care of housing needs, and she keeps failing. Uh, 
and, and she's not getting any younger. Um, so give, give her more staff. Um, bite the bullet of the political debate that we all know needs has to happen here in order to think outside the boxes of the past. I helped to write Measure J when I was a law student clerking for uh, county council and Gary Patton was, uh, was moving that forward. So I've, I've been part of this for a long time. And uh, help us to think Thank outside you. the box. Thank you. Interns do go on to great things. Good morning. Good morning, board members. Uh, my name's Tom Burns, and uh, while I'm affiliated with affordable housing now, I'm here speaking for myself this morning and hadn't planned to speak, but I just think this is a really important item. Um, we all agree that we have a housing crisis in Santa Cruz County, while people can respectfully disagree about what to do about that. Um, and I really am pleased to see the board uh, making a number of initiatives. I wish they could go faster uh, to address uh, this problem. Sustainable Santa Cruz, the funding measure that will hopefully be on the ballot next year, and others. But I don't think the inclusionary housing program needs to be thrown in the basket with all those other things, and in fact, um, stand strongly on its own two feet. It's the one program that provides dispersed affordable housing units, and it's the one program that provides affordable housing for moderate income people, which you know is a huge need in this community, and not to say the Measure J has come close to meeting that need, but it's something. Um, those other efforts are going to take years, and so if this is put off today, we're talking about leaving this as it is for many years to come. In the decades of working in land use in Santa Cruz, I can't think of one situation where I heard a developer say, if it weren't for those inclusionary housing programs or requirements, we would be able to do X, Y, or Z. They complain about a lot of things, um, but that was not uh, the main thing that people complained about. Um, in fact, I'm sure the economics have all changed, but one of the previous speakers referred to development pro formas. I went through a number of those at the time, and it was really clean and really simple. The land value was based on the number of market rate units that could be built on the site. It was not based on the inclusionary requirements, so the developers paid for land based on that. They um, were able to recover most of their construction costs on the sale of the house. And again, that's not why they complained. Um, rental housing is more complex, and I understand the need for trying to create inducements for more rental housing, but to have the uh, opportunity, which I didn't realize till last week, already on the code, to allow Section 8 um, renters in those units seems like a win-win for Section 8 voucher holders who can't find units and developers who are seeking better cash flow for their projects. So in conclusion, Again, it's great to see the county taking seriously this issue of affordable housing, um, but don't hang this one up. It stands on its own and it provides some really uh, good, small, but everything's going to be small um, outcomes for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make some comments before I ask for continuance of this item. And that planning department saying, oh my gosh, we've spent a lot of time on this already, I know. But yeah, I think if we want to solve our housing crisis, um, we're going to need to change our ways uh, in some ways that haven't been done before. Uh, for nearly 40 years now, since the passage of Me Measure J and a short two-year term of um, the amendment to increase the fee structure. Um, affordable housing really hasn't uh, put a dent in what's available out there for us. Uh, and we have an ever-growing number of residents. Uh, to be clear, the, the county has slowed population growth as was desired with Measure J, uh, even as, it, as we continue to grow in this county ever so slowly. But we've seen as, um, permits for marketplace housing crept along at a, the 50 level year in and year out, uh, people kept adding up here. And 15% of very little doesn't mean very much. We now have what we have all identified as a housing crisis here. And I'm not for accepting a build at any cost mentality, but I'm 
and I'm not pointing our fingers at our planning department who has followed the continuous string of ordinance that has been approved by the um, County Board of Supervisors over the year and implemented by uh, county administrators. And, and really some of those decisions on housing are out of our hands when it gets to the Coastal Commission, possibly uh, site limitations for housing taking place, uh, the up and down marketplace. Um, and additionally, we always have to address some very uh, limited <coughs> infrastructure opportunities here we have, or shall we say realities that we have in uh, issues such as water and transportation. But I think if we don't, uh, if we don't change our housing, uh, our planning processes so people have a better understanding of what we want for them, we're gonna have the same conversation in 40 years or two years from down the road. So I, I believe some of the, we've, we've heard from the Housing Advisory Committee earlier today and right now, uh, and I do believe some of the ideas from the consortium of uh, the housing advocates, as they're called, I guess, uh, and others that has merit and we should continue this. I don't know how long we want to continue it. I think three or four, I don't want to have this thing go on for another two years. I think we ought to address some of the issues that have been brought up here and by those interests that have been mentioned. But if we could come back in three or four months or a short period of time um, and, and air some of those proposals openly uh, and consider including them in our housing. And I do believe our planning department has been listening to what others have to say. But some that r really particularly make sense to me um, is establishing a, a new mixed use policy, for instance, um, that more housing units are needed to make a commercial venture go if they're mixed together. Um, I, I think that uh, that has been discussed, uh, possibly adding ADUs as partially offsetting our affordable housing uh, inclusion of 15%, uh, establishing a bonus, um, which has been, been, made, uh, been mentioned by the planning department for including inclu uh, inclusionary affordable housing, and uh, maybe even establishing by right zones. Uh, we have limited properties here for housing to take place, but we have a tremendous need for that to take place. And so I, I would, I'm just not comfortable, uh, and I do appreciate again what the planning department has brought forward to us since our October meeting, but I think there still needs more, there's more that needs to be done and that we should take uh, into consideration more seriously. I've mentioned a few. Uh, I'm sure some of, the, uh, of our other board members have some ideas as well, but I think we really should uh, be different. Um, as was stated, think outside the box um, and really say, um, if we're gonna address this housing issue, and in particular, affordable housing, let's include some of these suggestions that have been mentioned and discuss them more thoroughly and come back in three or four months, five months, and really uh, be in a position, I think, to make a better decision. Supervisor Caput. Um, with the, uh, what's the current fee that we have for a unit that's uh, 500 square feet or less? Is there a fee right now? $2 per square foot of, uh, we're actually suggesting that we, um, I want to be sure I'm clear about what sure. type of unit you're talking about. If there was a new single family home of 500 square feet proposed, which would be unlikely, um, it, they tend to be more in the neighborhood of 1,000 square feet when they're small, um, that unit would be charged $2 per foot. An addition or an ADU would deduct the first 500 square feet and then after that be charged $2 a foot. All right, and then uh, I, I was looking at it, it, uh, it, it is rent, you know, control, controlling the rent, it's part of the agreement. Uh, and it, it did say like for uh, one bedroom would be about 1,044, mm -hmm. but if they, if they were put on section eight, they're getting about double. Yeah, uh, what you're referring to is the rents that can be charged on affordable units that are controlled by the county. 
Right. So for, for many years, the Measure J program has had a provision, they're called investor owner units. Um, they're allowed to be rented. The rent is set and required to be affordable, calculated at 60% of median income. Um, the board changed the policy in 2012 to allow for the higher rents. And the reason for that was really, um, we were having a crisis which has continued um, to find, for, find units that people with Section 8 vouchers, other tenant-based subsidy can use. Um, we have found that that provision of allowing fair market rents to be charged is actually um, proving to be very interesting to, to developers looking at building rental housing because they can have deed restricted units. And remember, under the density bonus program um, that is currently in place, chapter 1712, which is consistent with state law, 35% um, of those units are deed restricted as affordable in perpetuity, so forever. So the landlord is agreeing to do that, that, that uh, agreeing that they will always rent to um, low income households and charge them an affordable rent. So the fact that your board has that policy actually is, we believe, an incentive to density bonus projects, and we believe that, not by the number of projects that have come in for approval, but by the number of developers that are coming to talk to us um, about density bonus um, projects, which would get us additional units. They do tend to be small, um, so, because they're rental units and they tend to be smaller units, which we want more of. Thank you. Uh, I had a couple comments that I wanted to make. Um, when, um, when we made this change a couple years ago, um, I didn't support it. Um, I thought it, was, it wasn't a good policy strategy. Um, <coughs> it was, th there was no clear information um, uh, from developers uh, that said that it, it was a real effect on them. Um, and the board decided to try something. Um, in those two years, which people have said is not a very m long amount of time, I, I think in my district alone there was five units that were not built. So we gotta ask ourselves, how many years do we wanna do this? Do we want 10 units to go away, 15, 20 units, uh, one of the speakers says that it takes 15 years to get a, 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 a permit. So should we wait 15 years to try to figure this out? We didn't, the, the, I appreciate the staff work on it because it didn't just, you know, look at themselves and try to come up with something that they thought would work out. They actually talked to economists and they looked at, 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 at financial numbers, and they had pro forms. Um, so this isn't a casual recommendation, um, and I appreciate the um, testimony from our former planning director. He has spent a few years looking at development projects in Santa Cruz County, um, and so I take his uh, testimony uh, seriously. Um, Meanwhile, we, there's a, another side that says, well, give us time to put together something. You know, try to figure it out. Um, when I met with the, the, the representatives here, they didn't provide me with uh, any pro formas or economic information. It was just what they thought, and they had clear ideas of other things we should do. I respect that. and. I, I saw a draft just uh, yesterday of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership uh, paper uh, on housing, and there's some things that we're doing and some things that, they, um, that they'd like us to do. Uh, but uh, we're, we, we're not making, we're not, this change is not being suggested casually. Um, it, uh, um, and the other thing that I would, and, and not only has it been studied, but it's been reviewed by our volunteers um, as part of the Housing Advisory Commission, not once, but twice. Um, they have stated pretty clearly where they uh, stand on it. And just to be clear, this doesn't take away the ability for a developer to pay an in lieu fee. It requires them to come to this board. 
that's, that's far different than, than, than a mandate. Um, so I, I support these changes, and I think we should make them now. And I think that, that, uh, that uh, it, it will make a difference. To those who say those 500 units that were created by Measure J since the time uh, that, the, that that measure passed is not enough, uh, I would argue, show me a better strategy to build 500 units of dispersed housing in Santa Cruz County at no cost to the county. Um, and we could argue that it should have been more and that, 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 uh, that, if, that if we had some different policy, we wouldn't be in the housing crisis we're in. I would argue that's just not accurate. It's, there are communities across uh, uh, California, some who have inclusionary zoning, some who don't, some that have changed it, and we have a housing crisis in California. Um, this board has uh, uh, led an effort and been unanimously supportive of an effort around sustainable Santa Cruz. We should be talking about how we get that environmental work done on the sustainable Santa Cruz done quicker um, because if we had that done, we could make those mixed use changes that we talked about. We would have those new uh, zoning pieces in place. We wouldn't need to wait. So I, I say we, this is, th these are good recommendations based on real facts, uh, reviewed by economists, supported by our Housing Advisory Commission, um, uh, and even approved in concept unanimously by this board just a couple weeks ago. So I think we should move forward with it. And it doesn't mean we stop the discussion. It means we continue the discussions and we work hard. And maybe we need to, to think about strategically, do we need to, to provide extra money to planning to get the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan done quicker? But I, I, would, I don't think we should miss this opportunity. Supervisor Kennedy? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, I'm somewhere in between the comments of the, my fellow board members today. Um, I support returning to an inclusionary option at the board's discretion, um, but I also appreciate Supervisor McPherson's ideas around looking at other changes we can make um, in order to uh, create incentives. Uh, for not only more market rate housing and more affordable housing, but also smaller housing in both those categories. And I'm not sure our fee structure is doing quite enough when I look at some other jurisdictions to, to really look at how we can use these fees to create incentives in both the market and, um, and the affordable category. And so uh, I think wait a couple months, I'll bring maybe a few, I don't wanna wait for the code modernization and have the the two, um, although I agree with Supervisor Friend that the two are intricately uh, intertwined, but I do think are there, there may be some interim things we can do to add a little nuance and to add some other incentives in order to get the kinds of housing um, that we so desperately need. So I support um, you know, a, a, a short delay that allows for some, uh, some more conversations uh, within the context of assuming if there are the, the votes that we move towards uh, reinstating the inclusionary piece, but what, what else can we do to make sure that, uh, that we maintain market interest in smaller units, more units, uh, and, more, and obviously more affordable units. So, uh, um uh, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, do you want to you attempt a motion? Yeah. Sure, uh, so I, I'll move to continue this item until uh, the second meeting in March, whenever, the, whenever that is. I'll second. Uh, well, let me ask a question. Are we not gonna change the, 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 the fee structure or anything else? I mean, I, I'm just. I, I, still, I still have some questions around the fee structure and because, because of the size, my interest in in creating some incentives, so I wasn't uh, quite ready to go there yet today. All right, so there's a motion by Coonerty seconded by Caput to uh, continue this item to when? Second meeting in March. Second meeting in March. So March 20th. March 20th. Uh, I'll just say uh, 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 I don't support the motion. Um, I, I think we could make these changes and still continue the discussion and come back on March 20th 
and and uh, m make things even better. Um, I, uh, I I think this is a missed opportunity. Uh, this would will be a missed opportunity, and uh, you could use the same reasoning to put this decision off uh, forever and always. And uh, as as sometimes you have to just sort of. Um, you know, make a, a clear decision and, and move forward and continue to, to use all the tools that we have to accomplish our policy goals. Would, uh, what, what is the staff recommendation? Uh, to actually vote on it or continue it? No, to, con to, to vote on it. You have in your packet a yeah. red line of changes to chapter 1710 of the county code. Um, so there's a number of provisions that have been discussed from the last meeting and this meeting. That includes some changes. So um, the recommendation was to hold a public hearing um, and discuss the changes to the code uh, and um, ma make a decision one way or another. Okay, so to, to make a, a final vote on it, I, I mean right now rather than continuing it. Yeah, it's, it's on the screen right in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Do we have any other comment on this, uh, on the motion or anything? Uh, I'm going to be supporting the motion. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. Glad. All right. I just don't want to, you know, throw. Um, I, I hear your point there, and I just don't want to make it a lot harder on your staff. So, okay. <laughs> All right. But I'll, I'll support the motion, though. Um, if there's no other comment, uh, a call for the vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. So on a 4-1 vote, uh, we vote to continue this matter till March 20th. Uh, that brings us to the end of our morning session of the... Oh, we have one oh, more. we got one more. Sorry. We'll move on to item 60, which is consider reappointments of Julia Hill and Alan Smith, the Law Library Board of Trustees for term to expire December 31st, 2018. I will take a motion. Uh, mo motion by McPherson, seconded by Caput. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. That ends our morning portion, and we will be coming back at 1.30 uh, to hear the remaining items on our agenda. We'll be taking closed session at the end of that.